The uh, committee will come to order. Good morning. Today's hearing is on the health care law's impact on jobs, employers, and the economy. Uh, we'll have two panels today. Our first panel uh, will, will uh, feature Austin Goolsby, who is chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Um, I'll begin by making an opening statement, and then I'll uh, yield to uh, my friend and ranking member, Mr. Levin. Uh, I want to start by reading the following quote. I know one of the things that, that's come up is that the 1099 provision in the health care bill appears to be too burdensome for small businesses. It just involves too much paperwork, too much filing. It's probably counterproductive. It was, it was designed to make sure that revenue was raised to help pay for some of the other provisions, but if it ends up just being so much trouble that small businesses find it difficult to manage, that's something we should take a look at. So there are going to be examples where I think we can tweak and make improvements, end quote. That was, the president, that was President Obama on the day after the November elections. The President was saying the health care law appears to be too burdensome for small businesses, that it involves too much paperwork, too much filing. And last night, in his State of the Union address, the President again referred to the 1099 provision, as we've come to call it, as a flaw. But more importantly, the President asked us to identify and bring to him items that need to be fixed. And clearly in a bill that's over 2,000 pages long, there is more than just the 1099 provision we need to address. With unemployment rates stuck above 9 percent for the last 20 months, and with my home state's unemployment at nearly 12 percent, I have one simple question today. How is it that Congress passed a health care bill that is, quote, counterproductive to American employers, especially at a time we need to be looking at solutions that encourage, not impede, job creation? That's the focus of our hearing today, the health care law and its impact on the economy, on employers and their workers. As signed into law, the Democrats' health care law imposes more than one-half trillion dollars of tax increases and thousands of pages of mandates and onerous regulations on employers. Uh, my friends on the other side of the dais have argued that we shouldn't be debating health care anymore, that we need to move on and focus on jobs and the economy. Uh, what they need to recognize is that employers of all sizes are expressing concern that the new mandates and regulations will deter them from hiring new employees, threaten their ability to retain existing workers, and harm their ability to increase wages for existing employees. The new health care law compounds the uncertainty employers and entrepreneurs are facing amid the most challenging economic climate since the Great Depression. Making matters worse, many insurance companies and employers have already increased their health care premiums to comply with the new health care law, exacerbating the drag on the U.S. economy from rising health care costs. That's the problem with the health care law that puts Washington, D.C., the federal government, at the center instead of patients and doctors. And when you take a Washington knows best approach to legislation, you usually end up with a bill that only works for Washington instead of working for the American people. At the end of the day, the health care law fails to control costs. It fails to let Americans keep the insurance they have and like, despite the President's promise. It fails to protect jobs. It fails to ensure seniors have access to their doctors and hospitals. And fails to prevent tax increases from hitting middle class families and the small businesses we need to move our anemic economy forward. The hearing today is just the first of many with regard to the health care law. It's my intention to give the American people and employers, both large and small, the opportunity they did not have when this law was being written to testify in an open hearing about the impact this law will have on them. We know what the experts have said. We all know that the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has estimated the health care law will increase premiums for millions of families by up to $2,100 on average by 2016. That's $3,200, $3,200 more expensive than the Republican alternative I offered last Congress. We all know that the Obama administration's own officials have predicted that as many as seven out of ten employers will have to change the coverage they offer to their employees because of the law. We all know from the Joint Committee on Taxation that there are well over $500 billion in new taxes, many of which will hit middle class families and small businesses. That's what the experts have told us. Today we will hear something different. We'll also hear from real employers and what they think about this law and what they think the impact will be on their businesses and their employees. I look forward to hearing this testimony and getting more of this sort of insight in the future. After all, these are the very people who have to live with the decisions that are made here in Washington. But before we do, I ask unanimous consent that all 
members be allowed to submit an opening statement for the record. Hearing no objection, I now yield to the ranking member, member Levin for the purposes of an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Goosby, I understand, will be here until 1030. He'll have a chance, Mr. Chairman, to respond to uh, some of your criticisms that I don't think are valid. Uh, but uh, we want to hear from you, Dr. Goosby, so I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, last night, uh, the President uh, said some very clear things about uh, the health care issue. He said, and I quote, instead of refighting the battles of the last two years, let's fix what needs fixing and move forward. End of quotes. My concern about the hearing is that indeed uh, will be refighting the battles of the last two years. For example, as to 1099, uh, we uh, introduced legislation uh, in the last session. It passed here. It was opposed by the then minority uh, because of the pay for. Uh, ironically, uh, much of what is in the, was in the pay for is now the law of the land. Uh, we should have acted on 1099 uh, last session. In his speech, uh, the President also said, uh, and I quote, well, I'm not, uh, what I'm not willing to do is to go back to the days when insurance companies could deny someone coverage because of a pre-existing condition. He went on to point out that the law is now making prescription drugs cheaper for seniors and giving uninsured students a chance to stay on their parents' coverage. So I repeat, he then went on to say, instead of refighting the battles of the last two years, let's fix what needs fixing and move forward. I think that's exactly what we should do, and I would hope that would be the tone of the hearing today. I yield back. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Goolsby. Uh, under our rules, you'll have five minutes. Your written statement will become part of the record. And so welcome, and you may begin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to say good morning uh, to Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, and all the members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me uh, to testify here today. And, and I, uh, I know we were, we were up late, and I, I saw s several of you last night, uh, and I, I appreciate uh, your time. Um, the Affordable Care Act was designed to make sure that health insurance coverage was affordable for individuals, families, and businesses. And while millions of people are benefiting now, much of the impact of that act will begin when the major coverage provisions take effect in 2014. The best evidence that uh, we have gathered from outside experts suggests that in addition to slowing the growth of Medicare spending and significantly reducing the deficit over the next 10 years and the 10 years after that, that the Affordable Care Act can be a significant benefit to the job market by easing the burden of health care costs on small businesses and by reducing the growth rate of health care costs for all businesses. Now, the impact of the Affordable Care Act on the labor market is an important topic. I, I applaud you for, for, uh, for having this hearing. I believe there has been a significant amount of confusion on, on this issue, and, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to, to try to clarify that. Um, I, I think the President laid out last night in, in a way that is, uh, that is most helpful, and, and you iterated in, in your testimony, in your opening statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, th that we should try to work together to improve whatever is broken or problematic we should fix together. Anything that reduces costs is going to help jobs in this country. Health care has for years been one of the most pressing um, cost issues facing the business world. Those costs have been rising dramatically long before there ever was an Affordable Care Act, and uh, the Affordable Care Act's intention is to try to address that. I would highlight two uh, basic mechanisms that I think the Affordable Care Act can have a, has had and will, will have a significant positive impact on the job market. The first mechanism is uh, in the area of small business. Now, the role of entrepreneurs and small businesses 
in job creation and in the economy is well known. Equally well known is the fact that small businesses have for years consistently said that the cost of health care is one of their most significant problems. What small businesses that want to provide insurance for their workers face much higher costs than large firms do for exactly the same plans. And in many states, they also face the risk that a single sick employee or even an employee's ill family member will send their premiums through the roof uh, for all of their employees. The Affordable Care Act has begun to help make small business more competitive by making the health insurance more accessible and more affordable. One of the first provisions to take effect is the Small Business Health Care Tax Credit that helps offset the costs uh, of coverage. That applies to as many as four million small businesses that may be eligible right now for that small business tax credit. In addition, it, levels, it can level the playing field for small businesses by giving th these businesses and their workers access to the same kinds of stable premiums that larger businesses enjoy. The exchanges pool risk and reduce administrative costs for small businesses. New insurers will not be able to raise rates when some individual in the group becomes sick. And this will allow small firms to offer competitive health benefits. People can start their own company or go work for a fast growing small business without worrying that they would have to give up access to secure affordable coverage. And that impact on job mobility is critically important. The other mechanism that I would highlight are the many things that the Act does to try to reduce costs overall and reduce the health care cost inflation rate. These include the immediate reduction in the implicit tax from the uninsured. Right now, the uninsured get health care in emergency departments or in other very high cost ways. The estimates suggest that that is a hidden tax passed on to everyone else of up to $1,000 per worker. And by covering the, the uninsured, the Affordable Care Act will reduce that hidden tax directly. Second, it makes innovations in the delivery systems in Medicare and Medicaid that if we have successful innovations there that are adopted in the private sector can reduce costs. If you could it, just sum up very quickly. Sum up commitment to prevention and wellness to patient-oriented outcomes and to modernizing the health IT system, the, those cost reductions and the small business credits can have a quite beneficial effect on the job market. All right. Thank you. And as I, I said, your full statement will be part of the record, and thank you for that. Um, last night, the President did say uh, of the ongoing health care reform debate that instead of refighting the battles of the last two years, let's fix what needs to be needs fixing and move forward. And he mentioned specifically the 1099 provision. What else does the president believe needs to be fixed in this new law? Well, I would say uh, the 1099 provision, uh, which was designed to, to reduce tax evasion, um, but put this burden on small business was identified early as an important one. You saw the president last night also say he was open to look at things. I know that, that there have been uh, people that said we should have done more on medical malpractice reform, and he, the President said he was open to looking at that. Now, I would highlight that the Affordable Care Act does create pilots that it funds in states to figure out different states have experimented with ways to address medical malpractice reform, and it authorized examining and creating pilots to, to help us figure out what works in that area. But I, I would say that's an area that the president is, is open to, to ideas, and we would want to work with you on. So uh, there's 1099 and medical liability reform. Those are two items. Are there any other items? I, I would say that the president's open to working with you if you identify other items. But the, the basic thrust of the act of trying to get costs down and trying to help small business to afford care is fundamentally the right approach, and so, so I think that we want to stick with it. Well, in regard to holding costs down, um, which I appreciate that um, sentiment and goal, uh, both the CMS actuary and the Congressional Budget Office say the legislation that was enacted will likely increase, not decrease, national health expenditures. And if they're, they're right, 
isn't the health care law an economic failure that will increase health care spending and cost jobs? And I'm not asking if you agree with CMS or CBO, but I'm asking if they're right, isn't this reform a failure? Uh, I, I don't view it as a failure. I think the, the key thing of the Affordable Care Act is trying to get the health care cost inflation rate down. If more people are being covered and ha having their health improved and have the security to know that they cannot be denied coverage because of a pre-existing condition, um, the amount of total health spending is different than looking at what the prices are and trying to control health care cost inflation. So in my view, that wouldn't be the right way to evaluate it. But the, the expert nonpartisan agencies that we rely on, like the Congressional Bud Budget Office, like the actuaries at CMS, tell us that overall health spending is likely to go up under this legislation. And if the stated claim that holding down health care costs is really a justification for this bill and will help the economy and helps help businesses, particularly small businesses, and that isn't going to happen, how is this committee expected to evaluate this legislation other than that it, it doesn't meet the stated goals and that the reform that was purported is, is a failure? Well, I, I was trying to make the distinction, and I apologize if, 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 I, if I didn't, um, between the amount of total spending and the essentially spending per person or the cost of the same procedure. So the Congressional Budget Office um, and many health economists out in the country believe that the things that I have described in my testimony are ways that we can, for any given business, reduce the health care cost inflation rate and make them more competitive for small businesses giving health care credits that they can use to help offer health care to their workers where they do not now. Um, that, is, that is important. That will facilitate job creation. That is a different question than the, the one I, th I think you're asking, Mr. Chairman, which is what will be the total spending on health care overall not on the prices, but on total well, spending. And total spending has been rising quite dramatically for many years. And, and I would observe that CMS's data suggested that health care spending overall rose at the slowest rate this past year that it has since they have been keeping records. Well, the Congressional Budget Office also indicated, as I said in my opening statement, I don't want to repeat that, though, but that health care premiums for millions of families will also go up by over $2,000. Uh, for family, and obviously in contrast to a reduction in premium which occurred with, with the, uh, the bill that I offered. So whether you, however you slice it, whether you look at the macro sense or you look at individual families, costs are going up, and, and as you said in your opening statement, getting costs under control in health care is a very important uh, goal and I, I, absolutely one we should look at. Well, thank you very much. At this time, I'll, I'll yield to uh, the ranking member. Uh, he has five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Goosby, uh, you're very polite, and I think proceeding that way is important. But I think there needs to be driven home very clearly the distinction you make. Driving down costs does not mean necessarily that expenditures will not go up. We have now over 50 million people who have no insurance whatsoever. And bringing most of the 50 million people so they have health care insurance and have health care may increase overall expenditures while we drive down the cost per patient. And there's nothing inconsistent. And John Boehner's proposal has been analyzed. It would add only three million people to the insured. We are the only country, industrial country, on this globe that has anything like 50 million people who have no insurance whatsoever. The only nation like that. So you said it very discreetly, but I think it was clear, and I think we need to make those distinctions very clear indeed. Now, 
Let me ask you about another argument that's made about uh, the health care reform. And now that language has been somewhat moderated. I'll use what's been said here, that it's a job-killing bill uh, reform. Um, I don't think we should use that language. Whatever language we use, would you comment on that? Well, I would say as a strictly factual matter, I think it's an inaccurate statement to say the job killing. I think the evidence suggests that the role of small business in job creation and the role of reducing the health care cost inflation rate in job creation suggests that the two primary tenants of the Affordable Care Act may have even a significant positive impact on the job market. You may have seen the uh, health economist at Harvard, David Cutler, looked at the best evidence we have of the projected impacts of these various inflation-reducing measures and asked what would that mean for, for job creation or destruction and found it would be job creating to, in the nature of hundreds of thousands of jobs per year. If you look at the evidence on employers, health care costs have been rising dramatically every year for many years. And that has been a tremendous burden on them and has limited employment growth. So anything that we can do to reduce that inflation rate will have a positive impact. And, and I, don't, I did not mean to, in any way to, to say to the chairman or to anyone else that we should, we should close our minds and not be open to important ideas of how to improve this or how to find other ways to get costs down. We should. The president has made that clear. And, and I would like to reiterate that, that we are open to sensible ways to improve care, to improve coverage, and, and to get costs down. I think to describe it as job killing is not accurate based on the evidence that, that we have. Okay, just briefly, my time will end soon. In your testimony, you refer to Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute as something that can help uh, make treatments work better, and that means, I think, affect costs and try to get a hold of costs. Um, do you want to comment briefly on that? You have about 30 seconds. Well, I'd say Some the have idea. said that Washington's going to dictate the care patients receive. It's not. That, 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 that institute is, is not, a, it's not a dictation machine. It's not, it's not meant to do that. It is meant so that we can share information across the country of what do we find, what kind of treatments work. Uh, I, the best analogy is my own when I was a kid, uh, it was routine to take everybody's tonsils out. I got my tonsils out. I was in the hospital three days. I and uh, in a, of our own kids, I have three children. They, the studies indicated that that was not effective except in certain circumstances. Now, our middle son had, I'm not a doctor, but some kind of inflamed tonsils, had his tonsils removed. But our other two kids did not. And that, that is a case where, looking across the country, studies showed that it was more effective, that it was in some sense more dangerous to routinely just take all kids' tonsils out, and it, it's, it's quite a significant expense to both families and, and to, uh, to the health system that we were routinely doing that. I would use that as kind of a personal example of what the intention of this would be, would be to share that information All right. um, Thank so you. doctors would have. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, Mr. Herger is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Goolsby, I thank you for uh, appearing before us and your testimony. But as I listen to you, there seems to be a, in the administration a night and day difference between what I hear you saying on lowering of health care costs and what this Obamacare is doing for our small business and creating jobs and what I hear small businesses in my district telling me. And later this morning, we will be hearing from some small business owners who do know firsthand what it takes to create jobs. It's one thing to come up with academic arguments for why a particular policy will be good for job creation. It's another thing to have those results actually demonstrated in the real world. What we're going to hear from business owners in my district and what I've heard from small businesses is a very different story 
than the one you've presented. Their near unanimous opinion is that this health care law is going to absolutely be devastating to their small businesses and to creating jobs. Let me share with you some of the feedback that I've received from business owners in my Northern California Rural District. Robert Boise of Bernie, California writes, I'm a small businessman who is retired and collecting Social Security. I started my business in January of 2008 and it immediately took off. In 2009, I made more money than I ever have in my life and I was ready to add one or two employees when they started talking about Obamacare. I have now decided not to expand and to contain my business at a smaller size, close quote. And then from a Charles Watts of Chico, California writes, I have been a business owner, builder, contractor for 35 plus years and have survived three other recessions, this being the worst. What I don't understand is how our government figures that business owners can maintain work in an economy with a collapsed housing market with no future in sight of recovery for years. Our company is hanging on by a thread, and if I have to provide health care for employees, I will have to close it down, no questions asked. I would have no other option, close quote. And then a Mike Moen in Cottonwood, California writes, as it stands right now, I can't afford to grow or hire new employees. Currently, the paperwork alone is a nightmare in labor costs. If Obamacare is not repealed, it will definitely increase labor costs, which is the most expensive part of running a business. Also, the 1099 deal definitely needs to go. If I have to cut a 1099 to every vendor I use, I won't have time to do my work, close quote. Mr. Goldsby, this is just a sample of what I and other members of this committee are hearing from small business owner in the real world. I have double digit unemployment in every one of my 10 counties in my district. We cannot afford this uh, to get this wrong. Can you explain why the administration's claims are so out of touch with what we're hearing from people who are actually creating jobs? Well, Congressman, I, I respect that question and I, and I appreciate you uh, bringing that evidence. I think the, pr the one thing I have noticed in the, when, when I have talked to many small business people and large business people is some misunderstanding on the part of uh, some business people of, w of what's in the law or what provisions would apply to them. So small businesses are, uh, if you have 50 employees or fewer, you are, you are not required to provide coverage to your employees. Second, Small businesses, up to four million of them right now, would qualify for a very substantial tax credit to help cover their costs that they have never had as such a credit before. And third, as we move to the exchanges, for the first time, small businesses will be able to get insurance coverage at a price that is comparable to the price that large businesses currently offer. So among very small businesses in the country, the majority do not offer any health care coverage now. And the surveys of the NFIB and other small business organizations have shown again and again, before there ever was an Affordable Coverage Act, that health care costs are one of the most pressing problems facing small business, that they had very hard times hiring employees to come work at their businesses because the employees th that were at large companies would say, I would love to work at that startup, but I can't get coverage if I move there, it will be too expensive. Thank so you. I think I, I'm, your time okay. has expired. I, I, I apologize, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Johnson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, you've said a lot of things that uh, 
don't seem to be true in the real world. Maybe you ought to get out there and talk to people. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, that health care tax credit, for instance, uh, very few small businesses that I talk to and their employees will benefit from the credit. In fact, CBO estimated that 88% of those who get health insurance from a small business work for a business that will not receive the credit. There are different credit amounts and eligibility requirements prior to 2014 than exist after the exchanges are operational. And after 2013, an employer can only claim the credit for two years. That's not giving them much. One of the purposes of this hearing is to look at the impact of health reform law on jobs. I think we can all agree it is critical to pursue policies that create jobs, not eliminate them. And the health reform law places significant restrictions on physician ownership of hospitals. Uh, you've almost put it to a complete halt, and yet my experience with physician-owned hospitals, they are far above in the benefits to the patients of, of a regular hospital. They're precise. They know what they're doing. Many projects in planning had to stop and expansions were curtailed. Every one of those decisions had a negative impact on jobs in states like Texas. Industry experts tell me at least 30,000 jobs would have been created if this provision had not been enacted. Can you explain to me how the administration could have supported a provision they knew would negatively impact well-paying health care jobs in many communities? Well, Congressman, I, I will need to, uh, to look into this, this exact provision, and, and, I, and I will uh, get back to you. The, I know that the primary goal of the uh, various provisions in the Act are how do we provide the best possible care at the lowest possible price or with the lowest rate of inflation. If there are things about physician ownership of hospitals or any other subject that if that we can get together and work on and, f and find evidence that it could improve care and reduce costs. The, the president is open to look at, at any such ideas. Uh, so uh, so I, I, w I will have to get back to you on this. I I'm not familiar with the, with the details. Okay. Well, that's just one area that, uh, of that bill that doesn't appear to be uh, beneficial to the industry. Um, you know, uh, we talked about 1099 reporting requirements, and I presume now you are uh, in agreement that we need to get rid of that provision. Is that true? That is true. Okay. I'm hearing it from you and the president. I yep. Think. All right. Well, then let's do it. The health care overhaul provides health plans in existence on the date of the law's enactment yeah, that they would not be required to meet all the requirements of the new law. And you all argued that it would allow individuals to keep the health insurance they have and, and like. The statute did not define grandfathered plans other than to ensure that all plans resulting for the length of the agreement, it's clear that many employer plans will not enjoy the grandfathered plan protections from the new, new law. Can you discuss that a little bit? Uh, y yes, I, what I would say is the uh, Clearly, the intention and the overall impact of the Affordable Care Act is to the, the president believes in the private system, and it is designed to try to preserve uh, the option that if the employer is happy with the plan that they have, they can stick with the plan. Uh, the intention of the grandfathering clause is to make it so that uh, if there are things in the in the act that would have some uh, impact that the, that the employer or patient doesn't want, they could just stick with what they have. Now, um, you, you always have to choose the lines of, of what to draw, what counts as the same plan. Now, there is flexibility. You can, if you're getting the same insurance but you want to change providers, that's still permissible and you still keep the grandfathering. Um, if you fundamentally change the nature of what health care you're, you're getting, um, then the, the point of the grandfathering w would not apply. And so that, yeah, that's but isn't it only for in. two years after you do that? 
uh, in our time. On some uh, of the, it depends which, but on some of these, there there are phase outs. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McDermott is recognized. Dr. Goolsby, I I fly across the country 35 times a year uh, for 20 years, and I've been flying with United Airlines attendants who have now gotten a little older. Uh, and I, I doubt there's a single flight I fly on where there isn't one flight attendant who is working simply to keep her benefits because her husband has a job that doesn't have benefits. And when I read the, the attack on the job killing aspects of this bill, I, I, they read the report from CBO and it sounds like they're saying we're going to kill jobs, but in fact, that flight attendant would gladly give up her job at age 60 if she had health care for her family in some other mechanism. Now, is that killing the job or is that her choosing to leave the workforce? I mean, to me, that sounds like a retirement. And, and the CBO report that you're citing, um, they, they did make clear that there would be a reduction of total jobs, but that most of those would be on what they call the labor supply side of people not having to work as many years j just to keep their uh, medical benefits. So to, to me, that would not be a j job killing. That would, that would be a retirement. So it really is political theater, hyperperbole, to uh, make it seem like this bill kills jobs. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just an economist, not I'm, not, not, the, okay. I'm not the... Let me ask another question. I, you know, I, we're going to have another panel, and they've rounded up some people who say this doesn't help so small business. And I'm sure that if you go through this country of 300 million people, you can find some small businessman or woman for whom it doesn't work. But my, from reading your testimony, it sounds like more small businesses are buying insurance today. If I read the figures you had for United Health and for... Uh, for uh, Kansas City's Blue Cross Blue Shield program, it sounds like people are actually getting in because of the small business uh, tax credits. I, I think that's true. I would, I would make three points. The first is if you don't have insurance, which the smaller the employer you get, the, the greater the share, do not offer insurance now because they would have to pay substantially more for exactly the same policy as large employers do, this the small business health care credit gives them the opportunity to offer insurance for the first time, and you have seen substantial take up. Second, even if you already offer it, the small business credit reduces the cost to you in a way that has never e existed before. And third, we should not underestimate the importance of the exchanges that will be coming online which will allow small businesses to get insurance at the kinds of prices and steady levels that large employers have had. Those three things uh, are critically important to small business, and for years before there was a, 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 a re, uh, Affordable Care Act, they have been wanting to have for, for some time th these types of credits and access to this type of insurance. And they've also talked about wanting to pool and uh, so that small businesses could join a pool yes. and they could then buy like Boeing or Weyerhaeuser or one of the large company buys so that this really gives them the ability to get that kind of benefit is what you're saying. Yeah, that's, that's a better way to say what I was saying is it, it allows them to pool. That's what the exchanges are for, allows them to pool and get prices as if they were a large employer. I, you may not have read the testimony of the people who are following after you, but I, can you think of any reason why a small businessman or woman could not find a way for health care if they're making money? Uh, is, there, is there any reason why uh, beyond they don't want to do it? I mean, is there some or economic reason? I don't understand. If you're making money in a business, how you can't put some of that money toward the health care of your workers. You would certainly care about your workers, I would guess. Well, look, it, it'd be presumptuous of me to tell uh, uh, other folks, I, I, I don't know what the circumstances of different businesses are. I do know this, that if you take employers that are 
employing people without giving them health care coverage. Um, the reason that there would be a mandate is to try to get away from the system we have now, which is people who don't have coverage still get sick, and they go down and they get medical care at the highest possible expense, mm -hmm. and it doesn't become free just because it was in the emergency department. That's a cost that gets passed directly on to the employers who do cover their employees, and that cost is as high as $1,000 a worker. So I, I, I don't put any moral judgment of any kind. I know we've, we've been through a very tough spot in the last few years, and everybody's tr trying to get by, and we're trying to turn the corner to grow our way out of these problems. I think small business credits to help them afford to give coverage, as well as giving them the opportunity to buy at the kind of prices that, small, that larger businesses do, and doing everything we can to slow the growth rate of health care costs is, is important. All right. Thank you. The, the time has Thank expired. Yes. Mr. Tiberi is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Goolsby, the President repeatedly mentioned throughout the debate and, and afterwards that Americans making less than $200,000 or families earning less than $250,000 would not see their taxes increased with respect to the Democrats' health care bill. I'd like, to tell me, I'd like you to tell me whether each of the following and a yes or no answer uh, would, would suffice that were included in the health care law constitutes an increase in taxes for individuals or families making less than two hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. A new tax on individuals who did not purchase government approved health insurance. Uh, I, I, d I don't think that's an accurate way to describe it, no. Not a new tax? No, I don't think that's an accurate way. A new ban on the use of flexible savings accounts HSAs, HRAs on using pre-tax income to purchase over-the-counter drugs? Uh, I, I don't, that, that's not a tax increase of a, of a normal form, and that's part of a broader reform effort, obviously. An increase from 7.5% to 10% of income, the threshold after which individuals conduct, can deduct out-of-pocket medical expenses. Not a tax increase? Uh, I, I, as I'm saying, the, if you, I, I do not consider the Affordable Care Act as a whole to be a tax increase on people less than $200,000. Got two more. Impose a new $2,500 cap on families' ability to use pre-tax dollars to fund an FSA. A tw could you get $2,500 cap? $500 cap. On no, I, I, don't, I don't consider that a tax increase. Uh, a new 10 percent tax on indoor tanning services. Uh, <laughs> Not a tax increase? Well, th that seems like a uh, strictly voluntary uh, thing that one could choose. But not a tax increase. Here, here's the point, Dr. Goolsby. We have in this bill, and I'm quoting from the bill, a number of things that are gonna, that's going to impact people individuals who make far less than $200,000. I had a lady contact me in December who said she had just found out from her employer and her doctor that she could no longer manage her kids' health care costs with respect to prescription with drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and now she was going to have to contact the doctor every time she wanted to deduct something from her flexible savings account and had just found out in December, months after the health care bill was signed into law, that actually her tax was going to increase, her income tax was going to increase because her FSA was going to go from $5,000 to $2,500 and thus her income was going to go up with respect to her taxes, which means she was going to be paying more taxes. So two things were occurring in her mind that she had no idea with respect to the health care debate, that she was going to be paying more taxes and her ability to, to manage her health care was going to be taken away from her, that she was now going to have to call her physician's office, which is going to make, ironically, the physician's office more involved, not less involved, and there's a cost to that as well. So I know you, you chuckle about this, but the President was very, very firm in, in that nobody making less than $200,000 or families less than $200,000 would see income taxes go up. 
any taxes go up. And now we see a Department of Justice uh, defense that this bill is constitutional because it's a tax. The individual mandate is a tax. So on one side we say it's not a tax, or you say it's not a tax, the administration. On the other side you say it is a tax. So which is it? Well, Congressman, fir first let me apologize. I was only chuckling ab about the, the tanning salons. I, wa I wasn't meaning to, to make light of it. As, as I say, we are open to work. If we, if we look at the FSA rules, all I would say uh, on FSAs is this was part of a broader uh, package that it's not uh, picking out one thing in isolation and not taking into account other benefits. If you, if you are paying for something with a pay for, but it's going to reduce health care cost inflation or we're going to get additional coverage that you didn't have before, you, you do have to take it in totality before. Here's my point, that. sir. I'm just saying, if, if you are telling the American people and the President's telling the American people, if I'm advising you and you repeatedly say it's not a tax increase and Mrs. Smith, who sees her FSA go from 5000 to 2500 and now she can't buy baby aspirin at the store and deduct it from her FSA, she looks at that as a tax increase. So there's a credibility issue. And again, we can chuckle about it, but this is a tax I didn't increase. chuckle about if it. If you I, could I don't mean to just respond it. briefly, then we'll okay. move on. My, my only brief response is if it changes the FSA rule but simultaneously gives her a significant reduction in the cost of her health care, that should not be viewed as a tax increase on her, even right. though just looking at one component, she would say, I had, to, I had a disallowed expense on, on an FS, FSA, but the point is taken in totality, it's not a tax All increase. Right. Thank you. Mr. Davis is. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I guess it all depends on what the meaning of is is. Uh, this is a, a bit of a back of the future moment uh, when uh, taking it in totality, it's a huge tax increase. I deal with constituents at uh, all places in the economic spectrum, and they talk about a lack of purchasing power. They are seeing their dollars go down, and small business owners in particular, contrary to the uh, gentlemen that say this is not job killing, I have met with uh, uh, hundreds of business owners over the last uh, two years, uh, and uh, really since this bill implemented this year, business after business, our chambers of commerce uh, members are telling us and telling our office and me uh, they're not hiring people because they cannot afford to provide coverage, which leads me to a question. Uh, since uh, uh, we referred to uh, uh, the tanning tax as a strictly voluntary thing, I don't think the IRS agents would feel that way. Uh, but uh, I, I want to ask you about the burdens of the democratic health care law on, on small business. For example, suppose you own a small business with 50 or more employees, uh, and uh, that business is not eligible for the small business tax credit and can't afford to purchase health care for your employees. Contrary to the propaganda, rates have gone up significantly. They're going to continue to go up because we didn't get to go after the cost drivers. Uh, the health care law requires you to provide health insurance or pay a fine. Now, how would paying, how would having to uh, afford the cost of, of health insurance or paying the fine help your company grow and create jobs? Because when we get into this pricing issue here, there's, a, uh, I think, a faulty assumption that businesses have unlimited supplies of money. The vast majorities deal with vendors that have fixed costs on materials as part of a supply chain, and hence on the outside, they often, particularly if they're dealing uh, uh, with larger established businesses, uh, price ceilings that they cannot exceed. So that margin skinnies down. The average manufacturing company that's considered successful in this company might make an 8% uh, uh, profit margin at, at the end of the year. And we're watching health care just go up at an astronomical rate. Here's my question. Uh, how, how would having to absorb the cost of health insurance or paying the fine help you grow jobs? Tell me that. Uh, well, what that I is a tax in your bill. Well, here's what I'd say, uh, Congressman, and, and I pr appreciate the evidence, and, and we're open to work and looking at the evidence. If you take large employers, nine, more than 95% of them offer health care. If you go to the 5% that do not and say, isn't it going to hurt those 5% that they will be required to, to provide health care, I do think it is appropriate that we consider what is the cost that they are applying onto other employers when they aren't offering health care. And that's the hidden tax that already exists. The growth of health care costs has been astronomical year after year after year before there ever was an Affordable Care Act. 
and the Affordable Care Act is trying to bring that more under control. So that there are, that the majority of small businesses in the country, some four million, would qualify for the credit is good for those businesses. To try to find an individual business who did not provide health care before is over 50 employees, w is, not, is not planning to use the great benefit of the exchange to get the, so that they would have the opportunity to get significantly lower prices for their health care, to me feels a little bit of a selected example when taken in the well, Let's in take the this totality. to a simple, <coughs> the, uh, the small companies, why couldn't they just pull together? Wouldn't that make sense and uh, uh, to be able to handle this issue and uh, to have the government stay out of it, let the private market work? Well, the, the I mean, I ran a they, business they for 12 years and we ran, into this, we ran into this time after time where costs did go up. And, and the costs under this bill are going up dramatically. I know people who won't hire employees because they're gonna go over the 50th threshold. Why should I hire somebody if I'm gonna be taxed? And you called just well, a minute ago that as PA I say, didn't you're, you're selecting uh, a, a group of employers that's at some specific sliver, and I'm highlighting that there are millions of businesses just below that, which are the majority of small businesses in the country who are getting a very significant. Well, let me just point something credit. out. Uh, you, you've asked us to take it in totality, and just between Mr. T. Berry and I, we probably pointed out 20 individual examples that taken in totality all point to significant increases in costs on business under this bill. And, and I think we come back to the details. Uh, we're going to have to address the cost drivers, and we don't address the cost drivers beginning here in Washington with creating a huge new bureaucracy uh, that place, places more overhead. If you ask any business owner uh, about this bill, they'll ask the question is how can you create over 100 new agencies, commissions, and boards, massively increase the regulatory side of this, and somehow reduce cost? Well, raising taxes on businesses and cutting the uh, 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 direct access to benefits. Every doctor that I know calls this a denial of care bill when they look at the economic uh, aspects of this, uh, and we're uh, dealing with uh, very different sets of definitions of terms, and, and we can't be fluid about that. I yield back. All right, his time has expired. Uh, Mr. Neal is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like permission to insert the CBO's preliminary analysis of the repeal of uh, this health care legislation into the official record. Without objection. Thank you. And Mr. Goolsby, if we were to repeal the health care bill, as some are proposing, that means eliminating $40 billion worth of tax credits. Doesn't that represent a tax increase? It would be very problematic, and it would be particularly problematic on small business, um, but it would be a major tax increase. All right. Let, let me take you to some of the facts here. One of the difficulties in the discussion of this legislation is that if our friends on the other side are asked by the local news media in their respective constituencies whether or not they favor banning pre-existing condition, they will say yes. If they're asked, is it not a good idea to keep your children on your health care plan until they're 26, they will say yes. If they are asked if it's a good idea to cap out-of-pocket expenses, they will say yes. Carrying insurance from one job to the other, they will say yes. The problem with that argument is, from an actuarial reality or from risk analysis, how do you accomplish those outcomes if you don't require those who can afford insurance to buy it and to help those who can't afford it to get into the risk pool through the mandate. I mean, that, by the way, I wanted to say something for the record. This is very important. The mandate was the compromise in Massachusetts that was proposed by Governor Romney. That's how we got there. Senator Kennedy advocated for years, spent a career talking about health care. The difficulty is that in attempting to do it, the compromise became the mandate. Would you speak to that issue about actuarial reality, risk analysis, and what insurance companies might do to suggest that they could accomplish the former, as I've outlined it, to get us to the latter? Well, uh, look, I, I do think the, the basic uh, point of the matter uh, is to get away from the economic problem of cream skimming and figuring out who's more likely to get sick and dropping them. And when you have circumstances like that, a lot of times markets can, the, the free market can fail when you, when you have big differences of information like that. That has plagued the healthcare system all along, and that is the point of 
the Affordable Care Act is to try to get everybody into the system so you can't either free ride off your neighbor and so on the other side they can have some assurance that the probability of whatever illness is approximately the probability in the overall population as opposed to everybody that knows they have the some disease signing up only one, once they get sick. I, I think that's the basis. It, 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 I would encourage all the members of this committee and, and others to visit an emergency room on a Friday or Saturday night. And if you can't do that or you live in a rural area and it's more difficult, then I would encourage members to be in touch with their local hospitals to find out what health care delivery is in the emergency room. And for that man or woman who walks out of that emergency room thumbing their nose by suggesting that they beat the system, they really didn't beat the system. In fact, those costs are passed on to all of us. That's the whole idea of spreading risk, which I would have thought the other side would have paid a great deal of attention to, given their proclivity for the suggestion that we ought to allow the market to work. Look, I think that the, the, the uncompensated care Precisely. is a hidden tax on everybody, and it's a big one, $1,000 a worker by, uh, by some estimates, and we cannot forget that that tax exists. It's, it's very important, and, and we can get that cost down, and that's a, that's a big cost driver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Mr. Nunes is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goolsby, were you involved at all in the President's State of the Union address in designing it or writing it or reviewing it, previewing it? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay, so you're familiar with the health care portions of the speech yeah. last night? Yes. Okay. So the new uh, 1099 reporting requirement. Uh, last night, uh, to paraphrase, the President called it a flaw, I think. At what point did he have the, have the epiphany that it was a flaw? Um, I, I don't know uh, the answer to that specifically, but uh, the, the chairman quoted the president from a significant time ago. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't at the State of the Union that he, that he had it. Mm -hmm. Did the president or White House or anyone affiliated with the executive branch ever hear from any members of Congress that this was a problem, 1099 problem, during the year-long health care debate? Yeah, I, I wasn't involved in the legislative discussion, but it's, I think it's probably fair to say yes. Okay. Okay. What? So the president has has now admitted that uh, that the policy he supported was flawed. Uh, he asked for other creative ideas. Uh, where should this committee start? What creative ideas should we look at to uh, identify possible additional flaws? Other areas that we could reduce cost, improve quality of health care, uh, where should we start? Well, I, I do think that the, the previous Congress people have identified hearing from constituents and from business uh, leaders themselves if there are uh, ways that we can reduce administrative costs, reduce regulatory or com uh, compliance burdens uh, of the form. Any, uh, any specific ideas? Is there anything like 1099 that we should strip out of the current health care law or anything we should put in? Well, I think 1099 is a good one, and the President outlined that we should look together at the medical malpractice issues that can lead to defensive medicine and those things. That, that strikes me as, as also a productive place to look. So medical mal malpractice we should look at. Uh, any other areas I mean, you can think of? Those, those two plus the general uh, approach of talking to the small business community uh, strike me as, as three important ones to begin with. I want, I want to focus on the uninsured now, move to the uninsured. We've heard members of this committee already this morning say that there's 50 million uninsured, I think was the, the number, maybe there's more than that, um, or possibly at least people think there's more than that. Um, I was under the understanding when we passed this two new entitlements adding to the two old entitlements of Medicare and Medicaid and health care law, that this would be the utopia for health care and that everyone would now be covered. Uh, is that happening? Uh, I would say we are 
dramatically increasing the number by tens of millions in who's covered. There obviously was the issue of undocumented uh, immigrants who are not, were, were never intended to um, be getting covered under the. So, so how many new people have we covered since the law's been implemented that wouldn't have been covered under the old laws? Well, the, uh, the full coverage provisions don't go into complete effect until 2014, but the estimates are in excess of 35 million. Why did it take so long to, why did we wait till 2014 to implement this when we have this health care crisis and all these folks uninsured? Uh, I, 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 I know you didn't write the law, but you look at the numbers. Yeah, I, lo I look at the numbers on, it, on any significant change of this nature. Usually there is some transition period historically. Was it possible to hide the budget consequences of the health care provision? No. So we don't have a debt problem. We have a long-run fiscal problem facing the country for sure. But Does health care have a part in that? In reducing it, yes. The health, the, so this health care bill is going to reduce the, deficit, the, the yes. deficit? Yes, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, to repeal the Health Care Act would increase the deficit by a quarter trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Reichert is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goolsby, um, so I've been taking some notes while you've been answering questions. So this, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, um, you say was designed to reduce costs? Yes? Yes. Uh, improve access, increase access yes. for people? Um, slower the growth rate of health care costs? That is its intention. And reduce the deficit? Yes. All of those things. Um, I, I'm just a, an old retired cop. So I think, uh, you know, I'm not a doctor. I've not been in the medical profession. So I'm just trying to understand this like every other American across this country. So these were the goals. But I really I want to go back to what Mr. Nunes and some others have pointed out. I, I'm really having a tough time understanding how uh, a provision like the 1099 form uh, it gets included in a bill that's supposed to accomplish all these things, reducing costs, et cetera, because if I'm not mistaken, do, do you know how the 1099 provision was inserted in the bill? I, I do not. Who, you don't know what member of Congress or who came up with the language, or was it the administration that suggested it, that? It, it, was, I, um, uh, it wasn't an administration uh, proposal, but I wasn't involved in the legislature. So you have no idea. You're, this is your project, I'm right? Just the, well, it's not my, I'm just an economist. You're just I, a spokesperson? I, 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 I'm not a spokesperson. I'm well, an economist. So why, I, why I are you here evaluate, today? <laughs> I, am I am here to help evaluate well, the economics the of the let me, act. Let me just ask you the 1099 form. Yes. It, we don't know how it got in there. But, but somehow it increases the cost of the bill by $19.2 billion. You have to hire 16,000 IRS agents. How can that just be overlooked? I think American people have a credibility issue when you say that you're here to reduce costs and all of a sudden you mir miraculously you discover that there's a 19 point two billion dollar cost in there that shouldn't be there. How does that happen? Well, as I say, I, I wasn't involved when but, but Congress how does that passed happen? the legislation, but what, what I will say is the people that supported it were trying the goal, which has been a bipartisan goal, of reducing the amount of tax evasion. People who do not pay taxes on income that they should pay this was I know what designed in a way that excuse was me, excuse excessively me. burdened. Excuse me. Okay. I, I know what the goal was. I, I, my question was how did it get into the bill and, 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 your, and your whole premise is that this was to reduce costs and $19.2 billion gets somehow inserted into the bill and nobody know, no one knows how. My, did, my did I hear you say just a little same. bit earlier too I, that um, you can keep your health care plan if you like it or something like that? 
in one of your answers? That, that is the intention, yes. That's why the grandfathering clause exists. Oh, okay. I, I remember uh, uh, President Obama visited our uh, retreat uh, last year. And he was asked that question, and we've heard that time after time after time. You can keep your health care plan if you like it. Um, however, uh, in his comments to us, and I'll pra paraphrase his quote, he said, um, well, there may have been some language snuck into the bill that runs contrary to that premise. How, how do you explain that? If, I mean, you're telling me today I, I, that you, know, you can keep your health care plan if you like it, but the president says there's language in the bill that runs contrary to that, pr that premise. I, I apologize, Congressman. I'm not trying to be coy. I, I, don't, I haven't heard the president say that, but I, 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 can, I would like to look at that before I made any comment. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's in print. Okay. I, I would can you see why the American people are confused about this bill and, and whether or not it provides any benefits at all to them? whether or not it does all those things that you laid out earlier, decreases uh, cost, uh, increases access, and is good for business, and reduces the deficit. I mean, I just pointed out two things here that have quite a bit of controversy around it and seems to be rather serious conflicts uh, with the premises that you've laid out in this bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Thompson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Goldsby, thank you uh, for being here. Um, my colleague, Mr. Neal, asked that the independent CBO analysis be read into the record. And, and I'd like to just ask you on, on that issue. I'm glad he did that. It's an important uh, fact that I believe we need to uh, uh, take into consideration. But that analysis says, and I think you pointed this out, that this repeal, this bill, would actually drive the deficit up by about uh, $250 billion over the first 10 years, over a trillion and change uh, over, over 20 years. If, so if that were to happen and it had this upward uh, push on the deficit, how would that impact business and investment in this country? Well, uh, I believe that the, certainly addressing our longer run debt issues uh, is a bipartisan, is an area of bipartisan agreement that we, that we do need to do that and that to not do it contributes uncertainty. And so I think repealing this and making that problem worse would likely add more uncertainty to, on that. And a, and a hit on the businesses that we're trying to, uh, trying to, uh, or hopeful will will get going. Could, could be. The economy up. Uh, thank you. On the uncompensated care issue, uh, I just want to point out, I think everybody can find this out. I know that I did the run, and in, in my rural district in Northern California, last year, the uncompensated care cost was $70 million. And, you know, the, the uncompensated care ferry doesn't deliver a check to the hospital when that happens. That's spread out, and the rest of us uh, pay for that through higher taxes, higher insurance premiums, et cetera. Uh, on, the one, on the 1099 issue, I think it's important to point out that we took up the repeal of that bill last year in Congress, and uh, I think everybody on this side of the dais voted to repeal that. Uh, so this is not a, a newfound uh, issue. This is uh, something that we tried, uh, tried to fix in, in the last Congress. And I also want to point out that when this came up in the, um, in the debate, uh, I went out to every one of my counties and asked business people, chambers of commerce, as to the impact of that. And, and there was concern that it was going to uh, be problematic. Uh, a lot of folks said, however, that it's just a matter of time before the software catches up to it and the, and the problems resolve. But everybody, irrespective of their position on it, noted that it was trying to solve uh, almost $20 billion tax evasion problem. So as we repeal this, which we will do, we're going to need to figure out how to solve that, uh, that, that problem. And Mr. Chairman, on the issue of the uh, costs going up, I just want to read from a statement by Blue Cross or by Blue Shield of, of California. And I think everybody knows that uh, premiums have been going up uh, in, in my home state. But the, uh, the head of, of Blue Shield, and I'll quote, uh, writes, these rates reflect trends that were building long before health reform. Our individual market medical costs are rising rapidly due to higher provider prices, increased utilization, and the fact that healthier people are dropping coverage during a bad economy. Health reform, health reform, 
will help slow down this trend by expanding coverage, which will keep healthier people in the system and through quality and cost containment initiatives such as the Independent Payment Advisory Board, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and other in initiatives for prevention and coordinated health care. And I'd like to, uh, to ask that uh, the, uh, the head of Blue Shield's uh, statement uh, uh, specifically stating that health care reform has nothing to do with their increased price be uh, read into uh, the record. The statement and I will yield be back the balance of the time. Without objection. Dr. Bustani is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to my friend from Massachusetts, uh, I have spent countless hours in emergency rooms, and there is a hidden tax, as you suggest, but also your solution in expanding Medicaid coverage is also a hidden tax, and it's, an, it's basically an unsustainable situation. We can do better. Mr. Uh, Mr. Goolsby, my uh, medical career spanned 1978 through 2003, and to put it in perspective for you, in medical school, I saw the first drug to treat peptic ulcer disease, which radically changed not only the quality of care for folks, but the cost of care. And since then, of course, we've seen all kinds of you know, developments in pharmaceuticals and medical devices that have given patients more than just a hope and a prayer. I remember you know, dealing with heart attack patients, giving them an aspirin and a first-generation beta blocker, and now you know, in my career, we did complex open heart surgery uh, using all kinds of assist devices and things that have saved lives, improved the quality of life. I can go on and on about all the problems with cost, coverage, quality, and so forth, but I want to focus on one particular issue. Last night, the President talked about innovation, research and development, American competitiveness, and one area where we have stood out as a country is in our development of, of uh, medical devices and pharmaceuticals. We are first and foremost in the, in the world on this, and we stand to lose that competitiveness, partly as a result of what's being proposed here. The innovation tax, a 2.3% tax on medical devices. Now let me, why, why is this not only a, d a danger for innovation, it's also a danger to job growth and could potentially lead to significant job loss. Let me just point out a couple of statistics. 62% of the companies, 62% that develop these devices, that do the research and development, are very small businesses. 62% have less than 20 employees. Only 2% have greater than 500 employees. These are small and mid-sized firms that really take on the responsibility of, of creating that innovation and research and development. So my question is, will this tax on innovation run contrary to the President's plan to expand research and development? Secondly, w will it hurt job growth in, along with innovation? And thirdly, how do, you, how do you reconcile this with, on one hand, the President wants to extend the R&D tax credit, and on the other hand, he wants to impose a new innovation tax? I, you know, this is just very inconsistent. So, and then finally, as we look at tax reform in the big picture, and the President's talked about fundamental tax reform, cleaning it up, simplifying it, if you look at this bill, this law, it has added significant complexity to the tax code way beyond where we were just a year ago. And so I would like you to address those, those three points. Okay, uh, Congressman, well, first let me thank you for your service uh, to the country as a medical professional as well as a, as a doctor. It's, uh, it, we, we, need more, uh, we need more people in the medical profession at, with a commitment like that. I would say on the issue of medical devices, the area of innovation, medical innovations uh, particularly, are critically important both for our health and for our, for our industrial base. In this case, the medical devices um, fee is being offset to some considerable degree by the fact that there will be an expansion in the demand for those devices 
by the fact that we're having 35 million plus new customers. But uh, sir, that, that's that debatable because purchase. a lot of these patients are getting that care. It's just not being compensated for. In I can tell I, you, I, I've I operated on patients you, you, you done, uh, I, I would, complex I would, open would heart like surgery and you know, never saw a penny. Were they advanced devices? Advanced uh, devices as well, yes. Look, this is an area, if there are areas that, that have a negative impact on innovation, we should examine those. Now, it had been our data that we, that we first came to the table with. The suggestion was that the increased demand uh, for the medical devices would be in some sense far in excess of, of what impact the charge on the medical devices would be, but we are open to, to looking at You really that. need to look sure. back at that assumption. Um, on R&D tax credit uh, and medical innovation, quickly, that, that's, a, that's an area the President's put as much or more um, dedicated as much or more resources to, to medical research uh, as anyone ever has before. All right. Thank you. Mr. Heller is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, holding this hearing. I know it's a little backwards uh, to actually hold hearings after a bill passed, but at least we'll have a hearing on the bill, so thank you. Um, last night, uh, and thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Goolsby. Last night, the President said, if you have ideas about how to improve this law by making care better or more affordable, I'm eager to work with you. Um, do you believe he meant that when he said it? Yes, I do. Well, he said the same thing in 2010 during his State of the Union. Do you believe he meant it when he said it then? <clears throat> yes, I do. He said it in 2009. Do you believe he meant it when he said it then? Yes, and right. I hope that we will commence working together. Well, I got a letter here, July 23rd, 2009. I wrote the president asking him specific questions about the health care bill because he wanted input. July 23rd, 2009, he didn't reply to the letter. Why didn't he reply to the letter? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. In uh, September 8th, 2009, because I received no reply from the first letter, I wrote him another letter. And I think it was pretty reasonable, I, uh, and I'd like to quote some parts from it. Uh, it says, uh, I introduced the Step Towards Access and Reform, the STAR Act, in late July. While this legislation will not be a silver bullet solution to all the problems facing our health care system, my bill addresses medical liability reform, improves access to breast and lung cancer screenings, takes other important steps towards reform that I think most Americans would support. I never received a response from this letter. Why didn't I receive a response from this letter? Yeah, Congressman, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I will offer to read and respond to the letter or find I I anyone that, that would. I, I mean, the, if, if your um, ideas address medical liability reform, other forms of screening or preventive care, that sounds like exactly the kind of thing that, that we want to always be on the lookout for good ideas. I guess my point is, would a reasonable person believe that the president had no interest in what the minority party at the time had to say on this piece of legislation? I don't think a reasonable person would, would believe that, but uh, I can see that it would be frustrating if he did not uh, reply to the letter you sent him. Would a reasonable person believe what he said last night? Again. Yes, I think they would, and I think, I think they did, and, and I'm here to say that we are open to the ideas, and, and I, would, uh, I would be both open and appreciate to see that or, or other letters. Do you think the uh, President, you mentioned tort reform, do you think he's serious about tort reform? Yes, he mentioned the, the medical malpractice reform in general. There, there is some uh, significant pilot projects and working through the states in the bill now, and the President is open to looking at beyond that. Let me ask a couple other questions. Uh, do you agree with the President and CBO's assessment that the health care bill signed into law last year will reduce unemployment? Yeah, I, I believe that it has the potential to be a job creator because of these cost-saving measures that I outlined in my testimony. When? Uh, over the next 10 years and over the next 20 years, so maybe the small business part would be keep immediate. keep throwing out 2014. Maybe in 2014 we'll reduce unemployment through this bill? Uh, no, I, I, th I think it's the small business 
credits um, can have and have had an important impact right away, and there are other parts that come in in 2014. Okay, so you're saying that we should at least have seen some impact on unemployment with the passage of this bill last year? Over what it would otherwise be. That, that's the conclusion. That's not just my conclusion. That's the conclusion of many outside experts. Why is Nevada's unemployment level at 15 percent? Um, and what impact I, has that had on the unemployment in Nevada? Well, I, I believe that the reason Nevada's unemployment rate is high, like the unemployment rate in the, in the rest of the nation, is because we have gone through the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression that has had a devastating impact on the economy, and we are trying to work our way out of that. So you I don't think, think the Affordable Care Act okay. is not the cause of So you don't think higher taxes, bigger government, and unreasonable regulations would have anything to do with the unemployment rate in Nevada? The taxes have actually been lower. The President cut taxes for 95 percent of workers and has not raised taxes in that sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you. And because of our time limitations, uh, the next questioner will be the last questioner for this panel. And Mr. Blumenauer is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Goldsby, I'd like to go back just where you left off um, a moment ago, uh, because uh, this litany of somehow higher taxes and more regulation, um, if I understand it correctly in your testimony, uh, you pointed out that we've had a million job, private sector jobs added in the course of the last year. Is that correct? Yeah, 1.3 million, actually. And if memory serves, that's more than the net job creation of the entire Bush White House years, in eight years. I believe that is true. And in terms of taxation, um, in, for the, over the course of uh, the last year and a half, isn't it true that taxes were actually lower than they were prior to uh, the President taking office because of uh, the 40 some percent of um, the Recovery Act that was tax reduction? Yes, that's certainly true and it's certainly true in the aggregate as well that the, the tax collections as a share of, of income are down. So to somehow uh, have the speculative bubble that burst in Nevada, which is probably worse than any state, perhaps with the exception of what happened in Florida and in uh, uh, parts of uh, Arizona, um, to try and blame that on the administration's high taxes um, and uh, health care. Isn't that kind of turning the facts on their head? Well, I, I'm not. I, I've been to in Nevada words many in times mouth, and enjoy it there. I'm not trying to get in anybody mad at anybody else. I will say the President did not raise taxes, cut taxes, did everything he could to prevent a depression, and we avoided a depression. And now we are to a phase, as the President outlined last night, that we need to, to grow and innovate and compete, and he's open to ideas from both sides of the aisle of how to improve the Health Care Act as well as other ways to innovate. Terrific. Could you comment for a moment on the trend line we were on in terms of affordability of employer provided health care uh, in terms of before we gave the tax credits that people actually made it easier and and the health care plan actually gives an alternative to people if employers uh, jettison them under the reform act we have near people will have an alternative but what was the trend line we are on uh, if the health care act is repealed I would say uh, before the Health Care Act, I would summarize the trend line as bad. And so if we repeal it and go back to that, I think it would return to bad. So I guess what I would say is that the, the Act is attempting to address a series of cost drivers. It's trying to help small business. There are things like the 1099 uh, aspect of the bill. There are other things that may need improvement. but I. I fail to see how the correct answer to some flaw is to get rid of tax credits for 4 million small businesses to allow discrimination against pre-existing conditions to 
reinstate the uncompensated care hidden tax on employers. The, a number of things in the bill that are really good. Um, I don't see why we should get rid of those rather than just fix the things that need to be fixed. And of course, for the record, our committee passed and the House approved legislation to fix the 1099. So that's something that uh, last Congress we were on. I want to just conclude on the notion of what impacts there are for small business. Currently, small business pays more, our committee has heard, pays more than large business. Uh, they are doing it without the, uh, up until the Affordable Care Act, without the tax credits. Uh, how is small business going to be affected if some of my friends have their way and somehow this bill is repealed? Um, if, if you repeal the bill, I believe it would be a <laughs> significantly detrimental impact on small business. That while you can try to find an individual small business that fits in some place and say that that person would be harmed, we know overall four million small businesses qualify for a health care credit that they never had before that they have wanted for decades. And we know that to set up exchanges that allow the pooling of risk will allow small businesses to get health care coverage and insurance at prices that are significantly lower uh, than they are now because right now they have to pay significantly more than large businesses do and that's a major competitive disadvantage. And you said this last Thank year you. health care costs went up at a lower rate than ever before recorded. It, it was sorry. overall spending. All right. Th I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, all time has expired. I want to thank you, Mr. Goolsby, for appearing before the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, I appreciate your testimony. And since all members have not had a chance to question, I'd ask uh, you to allow members to submit questions in writing, which will then become part of the written record of this hearing. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, your, uh, for giving me that opportunity. And I would be happy to, to accept any questions, letters, or anything else from members of the uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, panel one is concluded. And we'll now move to panel two. Uh, be, while our panel gets seated, I, I did want to introduce our panel to the committee. Uh, we have three witnesses on panel two. Uh, Mr. Douglas Holtz Eakin uh, is currently president of the American Action Forum and is a commissioner on the Congressionally Chartered Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. Uh, during 2001 and 2002, he was the chief economist of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He previously served as the sixth director of the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Mr. Olivo is the president and co-owner of Perfect Printing, located in Moorestown, New Jersey. It was established in 1979. He has been president of the second generation firm since 1988. It was originally established as a traditional retail copy center, and he has grown the business from 10 employees to 45 employees. He co-owns the company along with his wife, mother, and two brothers. Mr. Scott Womack uh, is a, a, a franchisee, and during his time as an IHOP franchisee, has received numerous sales, growth, and performance awards, and was named Midwest Franchisee of the Year in 1993 and 2005, and Regional Franchisee of the Year in 2008 of the Northern Region. I want to welcome our witnesses to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, thank you much, very much for taking uh, time out of, I know what are, are busy schedules to be here and help enlighten the committee on the health care law's impact on jobs, employers, and the economy. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to give your testimony. There is a green light, and then there will be a yellow light, which uh, gives you one minute to sum up, and then the red light is to conclude your testimony. And obviously with all the people who want to have a chance to ask you questions, we're going to try to stick pretty closely to that schedule. So why don't I, why don't I begin with Mr. Douglas holtz -Eakin. Welcome to the committee, and you have five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Levin, and members of the committee. It's a, a great pleasure to be here today. I appreciate the opportunity to appear. Uh, in my written testimony, I uh, sought to make four points that I'll briefly summarize here. Uh, the first is that the mandates and assorted taxes in the Affordable Care Act 
are an impediment to jobs and growth in the United States, particularly at this moment, that on balance, the Affordable Care Act will raise the cost of insurance. Uh, this will crowd out uh, scarce resources for hiring and for increasing pay and directly hurt consumers. That the Affordable Care Act has strong incentives for employers to drop their employer-sponsored insurance. To the extent that they do so more than the CBO uh, anticipates, uh, we will not only have a uh, strong disruption in labor market uh, contractual relationships, we will also have a much larger budgetary costs associated with the act than were anticipated. And that finally, even if that doesn't come to pass, the Affordable Care Act uh, is indeed a budgetary danger at a very, very important moment in the U.S. fiscal history and is a strong step in the wrong direction. Uh, let me begin by uh, elaborating on the latter only briefly. Uh, I, I think my views on the Affordable Care Act's budgetary implications are by now well known. Uh, we are in a situation where the fiscal outlook is a direct threat to the U.S. prosperity and freedom that to undertake this act, which has a wide array of uh, budgetary gimmicks, um, relies on unsustainable assumptions for cuts in Medicare, that double counts uh, particular receipts, whether they be the class act premiums, uh, receipts into the Medicare health insurance fund under various taxes, or social security premiums, and to otherwise omit costs from the legislation itself gives a very misleading picture of the budgetary impact, and then any fair reading of it is that it increases the deficit dramatically by as much as $500 billion over the first 10 years. Uh, more generally, at the common sense level, we cannot set up two open-end entitlement programs that grow at 8 percent a year, as far as the eye can see, faster than the economy will grow, faster than revenues will grow, and not fix Medicare and Medicaid and expect uh, to improve the budget outlook. And this, uh, this act did not. Turning to the labor market implications, uh, there, are, there are many mandates um, and taxes, and these will compete for resources for hiring, and they produce a bias against labor. If you look at the employer mandate, the best outcome for employers who have more than 50 employees is that it's a non-event. The best thing that could happen is nothing. The worst thing that could happen is they'll be subject to penalties and fines uh, and lead to drops in coverage. For those with fewer than 50 employees, this is a barrier to growth. Adding the 50th employee uh, is, a, is a severe tax, and any small business is going to recognize this. There is in the act, as has been widely uh, advertised this morning, a small uh, business tax credit. It's important to recognize that it is temporary so there's no permanent uh, fix to this problem. It is very complicated, and if, even if does someone wind their way into it, it has negative economic incentives for growth. If you add employees or pay better, you lose credits, it's a tax on your success and, and should be perceived as such. There are 700 billion other dollars worth of taxes in the Act. Uh, there are um, taxes, uh, for example, a surtax on uh, payrolls, uh, labeled a Medicare payroll surtax at 9 tenths percent. There's a 3.8% 3 investment uh, net investment tax. These have nothing to do with health care reform. These are pure taxes. They're exactly on the same group of small businesses and entrepreneurs. They're at the focus of the recent uh, discussion about the desirability of raising taxes in a recession. This bill replicates exactly the mistake that the previous Congress avoided, and they will hurt uh, jobs and growth in the United States. There are hundreds of billions of dollars of fees, whether they be on pharmaceutical companies, medical device manufacturers, or the health insurers themselves. As I lay out in my testimony, these can only be perceived as taxes. They will only show up as higher premiums in, uh, in insurance, and they have a dramatic impact because they are not deductible. So they are almost two for one more expensive than they appear. The upshot is that these uh, $700 billion of tax and fees will hurt the economy at a time when it can't afford it. The impact as well is to raise insurance premiums at a time when the economy afford it. And we've seen that on top of the additional benefits that the, the Act mandates. If you, you have to cover more benefits, you have to raise premiums. There's no way around it. This is an act, uh, uh, a bill that was going to raise premiums. And since it doesn't control health care costs, there's no offset on the basic underlying problem. We've seen that from CBO and the CMS um, uh, actuary. The upshot is we're going to see continued pressure upward on health care costs, on insurance premiums. The taxes will contribute to that. And employers may drop coverage. And if you're a worker who has their coverage dropped, you've disrupted your labor market bargain. That's a bad thing for the labor market at a weak time. Uh, so on top of the growth in uh, jobs incentives, we have the disruption for those lucky enough to have a job. So I'd be happy to answer your questions. I'm pleased to be here today, but I think on balance, it is a fair reading of this law that it is bad for jobs and growth at a time when we need both. Thank you very much. Mr. Womack, you are recognized for five minutes. And uh, your written statement will be made a permanent part of the record. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Camp, Ranking Member Levin, members of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you for this invitation to testify today. My name is Scott Womack, owner and president of Womack Restaurants, a 12-unit IHOP franchisee in Indiana and Ohio. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to testify on behalf of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I also come before you today on behalf of my company, um, my industry, and small businesses and entrepreneurs. My first jobs were as a busboy and a cook. After college, I joined the grocery industry. After five years, I got fired and found myself starting over. I was lucky to land a job at IHOP as a manager, and soon, with a $15,000 loan from my parents, I bought my first IHOP franchise. Uh, after 10 years, I began building IHOP restaurants. In 2006, I purchased a development agreement to expand into Ohio. Now, this would mean jobs in Ohio, not just in my restaurants, but also in construction, real estate, and also manufacturing. But thanks to this new law, those are not going to happen. The restaurant industry serves an important role in our economy, employing 12.7 million people. I like to say it's an industry of first opportunities and second chances. Uh, first jobs, first careers, a first shot at small business ownership, and also second chances for people starting over, maybe from a forced career change or reentering society from incarceration or a second job for those people uh, digging out of a financial hole. Stories like mine are born every day in the restaurant industry. The restaurant business is built on a small business model with profit margins of, of five to seven percent. We're the most labor intensive of any industry, ranking dead last in revenue per employee at $58,000 per employee. This compares to retail at 170,000, banks at over 400,000, and other industries that actually bring in millions of dollars per employee in revenue. Now, for restaurants, this new requirement to provide health coverage is not just a marginal cost increase. This is a huge new expense. And at $7,000 annually per employee, it is beyond our ability to pay. So let me just be real clear about that. You know, I estimate this to be 50% greater than my earnings. So please understand me, that's more than I can actually pay for the coverage. Our only alternative is to pay the penalties uh, those penalties are not tax deductible. So that puts my company at risk and many companies simply will not be able to pay those penalties and will not survive. Restaurants are already facing many challenges, including rising commodity, fuel and energy prices, rising state and local taxes, and higher unemployment taxes. Restaurants are unable to raise prices in this economy. We don't have a way to replace the lost income. Our only alternative is to cut costs. Cutting costs means cutting staff, means reducing hours, it means pushing people into part-time status. It also means that we will have to cut outside services, further hurting small businesses that serve my company. We'll be forced to stop building restaurants and forfeit our investment. This future development would have amounted to about $22 million in construction and development spending and 260 full-time jobs. Another casualty of this is the restaurant equipment industry which is a uniquely American industry. That industry has already been devastated by this recession. Furthermore, our lenders require us to maintain certain levels of profitability. Our mortgages, leases, and franchise agreements are commonly 15 to 20 years long. They do not go away in 2014. Those are obligations we cannot walk away from. Uh, other parts of the law are also causing harm. I may not be able to continue to offer the coverage that I currently offer to my management staff uh, due to the compensation non-discrimination rules in the law. Uh, obviously, there are other examples of issues that have been raised today, uh, issues with the HSA plans, taxes on investments, uh, tax on, on, uh, on the health insurance, and of course, the Cadillac, Cadillac tax, which will eventually hit everyone. Um, to that end, we are asking that Congress repeal this health care law. If that cannot be achieved, we urge you to address some of the major problems with the law. This bill is a ticking time bomb that will devastate our industry. Uh, a change, of course, now could end this uncertainty. Therefore, I'm asking you to introduce and pass legislation that would repeal the employer mandate. The members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce will work tirelessly to help you pass it. I thank the members of this committee for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to working with you in the future to fix the problems created by this law and implement real market-driven solutions. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Womack. Mr. Olivo, you are also recognized for five minutes, and likewise, your written statement will be part of the permanent record. Thank you, Chairman Camp, and thank you uh, to the committee for not just the opportunity, but the honor to provide my testimony today. My name is uh, Joe Olivo. I am a small business owner, and I appreciate being able to uh, relate to you my, the concerns that I have with the health care legislation, how it's already begun affecting my company, and some of the problems I see as the plan becomes uh, fully implemented. <clears throat> I'm the president and co-owner of Perfect Printing in Morristown, New Jersey. I own the company along with my wife, my two brothers, and my mother. It was started in 1979 as a literal mom and pop copy center. I've run the business for the past 23 years. We've been very fortunate. We've been able to grow it to a high of 54 employees prior to the economic downturn, and we, we currently have 45 employees. An area of which is great concern to me that's been spoken about today is the, the 1099 compliance requirements. Simply put, I do not have the resources in place to uh, implement, uh, implement this law, to cover, you know, to, to um, the resources that I'll have to put in place as far as software programs and calculating and managing receipts are, are just much more than I have the resources to do. And I think it's important when you think of the burdens that these legisl the legislation places on a small business, is thinking in the context of businesses like mine, in a good year, our profit is three cents on every dollar we earn. Every time there is a new regulation that's put in place such as this, it typically comes out of that profit margin. It leaves me less resources in which I can grow my business, give my employee wages, wage increases, and, and contribute to their, their benefits. A key issue for any employer is how and when to grow the business. My company is currently on the cusp of the 50 employee mark, which we were just there two years ago. And at that point, I would be legally bound to offer my employees insurance or face a penalty for not doing so. Besides being ridiculously complex, it's my understanding that even at the, once I go over the 50 employee mark, I can face penalties if one of my employees is eligible for the government subsidized plan, even if I am providing insurance. I'm still in the process of, try, process of trying to compute the exact ramifications of this part of the law, but based on my current premium rates, the penalty is actually less expensive than the premium rates. So I find it ironic that the part of the law that is, mandates me to provide insurance to my employees is really an incentive not to provide insurance to them at all. And this takes me to the issue of what we currently offer our employees. I am able to pay 100% of the premium cost for my individual employees. I pay 56% of the family portion. I'm able to do this because we're able to use a, a high, high deductible health savings accounts that we instituted six years ago. Now, this is important because during the debate prior to the passes, passage of this legislation, we heard time and time again that my employees would be able to keep their existing coverage. Within 30 days of the law's passage, I received a notification from my insurer that my plan would no longer be offered. So uh, my understanding is this because of the pre preventative care requirements and how it was treated under a high deductible plan was no longer in compliance with the law. So after 20 plus years of myself voluntarily providing insurance for my employees and paying most of it at my own cost, I am now told that this is no longer acceptable to the government. Another area of concern to me is the tax credits that have been mentioned today that were promised to small business owners to help us pay for insurance. This point was made over and over and even persuaded some in the small business community to support this plan because they felt it would be a net of positive for them. I can say now that I've checked the tax credits for my company of 45 employees and we are not eligible for a single dollar in tax credits. I've learned from fellow small business owners, I spoke to a woman that owns a bridal salon with three employees, and she had spoken to her accountant, she too is not eligible for a single dollar in tax credits. So these are the issues that I know and have already begun affecting my business, but it's the unknown that causes me as much a greater concern. You have to understand, when I grow my business, when I take financing to buy a new press or increase the investment of my business, I put my personal assets on the line. I put my home on the line as collateral, my family's home on the line as collateral. 
when you have this much unknown and unknown cost certainty in a law, and I challenge anyone on this committee to tell me what my health care costs will be two years from now, it, it creates much less of an incentive for me to take the necessary risk. So I'll leave you with this as I hand over the, the microphone. My story is personal, but it is by no, no means unique. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of small business owners across this country facing the same issues. And how can we, how can we ask those businesses to help the economy prosper, yet put a drag on one of the main engines of economic growth? All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for your testimony. We'll now go to the questioning period. And as I indicated, we will uh, pick up where we left off. And so uh, Mr. Roskam is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want the record to reflect that I respond promptly to emails and letters from Dean Heller and even shoves in the elbow. Um, Mr. Holtzegan, I'm sure you watched the speech last night that the President gave. And one of the things that struck me was his presentation of really a straw man argument, and that is the assertion, and we even heard that um, uh, asserted today from Mr. Goolsby that we don't want to go back to the days of um, you know, folks being pressed out and not included on pre-existing conditions. There's really nobody that's proposing that. House Republicans, uh, Chairman Camp authored, I think, a very thoughtful piece of legislation that dealt with that through high-risk pools. Could you comment sort of generally on this whole notion of two different visions? Um, Dr. Bistanti mentioned this in responding to Mr. Neal when he said, look, the underlying premise of, of this new law is to expand coverage by putting people on Medicaid. You alluded to this in, term, in, in your brief opening statement about entitlements outpacing the economy in general. Could you just give us a couple more thoughts on that? Well, certainly, thank you. And with all due respect to the President, I think it is an ar a straw man argument. If you roll the clock back to the beginning of the debate over health care reform, there was a bipartisan agreement that it would be desirable to control the growth of health care spending in the United States and to cover more Americans with affordable options. Uh, that, that's a bipartisan objective. Uh, the difficulty is that this law doesn't control costs, and unless that is done, you will never be able to uh, control insurance costs, and thus even someone who has insurance will, will find it unaffordable. Uh, the second thing I would say is that there are severe problems in using Medicaid as a, a source of coverage expansions. Having a piece of paper that says I'm a Medicare beneficiary does you no good if you can't see a provider. Medicare, uh, Medicaid beneficiaries are, are denied uh, providers you know, at, at much higher rates than Medicare or private insurers. About half of them can't find primary care physicians. So uh, they end up in emergency rooms at twice the rate of even the uninsured. That, that's not a solution to a coverage problem. Third thing I'd say is there is a competing vision. Uh, the, 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 the other vision is genuinely control health care costs. Give people control of their money, use those resources wisely, allow them to choose insurance that fits their family circumstances, their lifestyle, and, and make insurers compete, whether it be across state lines or more vigorously with, within states, so that you get decent insurance options and underlying control of the costs. That's another route to the same two goals, but it's a shared goal, and, that, and it always has been. Thank you. Mr. Olivo, um, the, the previous witness, Mr. Goolsby, said that there's a great deal of confusion about the health care law. And I was kind of thinking about that, and I was listening as he asserted that. And in one element, I, I, I would agree with that. There is confusion. There's a great deal of ambiguity, for example, about who gets exemptions from the administration. There's about 200 businesses or unions or other groups that have been exempted. Apparently, it's an exemption program that's only based on their initiative. In other words, you have to ask for it. It's not a blanket exemption. And it's not a permanent exemption. It's a one-time exemption. So there is a great deal of ambiguity and uncertainty, and you alluded to that. But at another level, there's a real sense of clarity about the health care law. For example, you figured out that the cost pressures on you are, are making a dynamic such that it might make more economic sense to your bottom line not to offer coverage and to have folks go into the, um, into the pool. You figured out that you're knocking on the door with 45 employees. Once you hit a 50 employee trigger, then your world changes on a whole host of things. Could you reflect on how it is that the health care law and that sense of clarity that I've articulated, how is that driving the business decisions for you and your family as you're trying to move this company forward? Thank you for your question. Yes, I mean, the health care 
The problem with the health care, the expenses have increased so much, uh, especially against any other expense within my business. And you have to understand, like I had pointed out, is when we invest and, and put our, our personal assets up for collateral, I don't have the luxury of being wrong in my assumptions. So when there are these costs, and I feel that there's costs that are unknown in addition to that, I have no choice to be reflexively much take much less risk, maybe not buy a, another presser, hire that extra employee until it's absolutely, I absolutely have to have them. So it, it really forces me to be much more conservative in how I invest in the business. Thank you. Mr. Buchanan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Eaton, I wanted to ask you a question because I get asked this a lot back home. Uh, and I think the ranking member had mentioned it. How in the world can you add 32 to 52 million people where you give either free or highly subsidized health care and think, uh, even though there's a third party out there that says that the deficit will reduce the deficit, where are they coming up with this information other than in, in Washington? Well, on the substance, I, I believe I've been very clear. I do not believe that this reduces health care costs. If you add that many insured uh, people to the pool, they will use more health care services. And all the evidence is health care costs will go up. With regard to the CBO's estimate of the budgetary impacts of the bill, uh, my gripe is not with the CBO, which does its job under the, the rules that the Budget Act impose. Uh, my gripe is with the, the drafters of the law who use the, the Budget Act rules to make sure that CBO came up with exactly the answer they wanted even though it was in defiance of economic common sense. Yeah, and I, I just want to say <clears throat> I was chairman of the Florida Chamber and uh, the chairman of our little chamber, and we had about 2,500 businesses locally. This has been by far the biggest issue in the last 10, 20 years. This isn't something that's happened the last couple of years. Everybody's challenged. I, I get hundreds of stories, but everybody is challenged, and that's why I don't understand if people really get out and talk to businesses in their community or not, <clears throat> being in business 30 years myself and not a career politician, I can tell you this is drowning a lot of businesses. I was in a business this week, one of the largest private employers in our region. His health care cost, uh, he told me, went up a million and a half dollars. Now, maybe he has 400 employees or 300 employees. If that's not job killing, and that's his point to me, I know they don't like that term, but when your premiums are going up, the CBO, I think, no, the CEO roundtable mentioned that health care costs are for a family of four about $10,000 in corporate America. They say in the next 10 years, with this health care bill uh, being considered, it's going to go from 10000 to 30000 uh, I was in another small business. I wasn't there to talk to them about, uh, they want to talk to me about private pharmacy. And he said, by the way, Mr. Congressman, on the way, going out. He said, I want to show you this, and he brought out his bill. Just got his increase a couple of weeks ago, another 23 percent increase. So everybody is going up 20, 30 percent a year. My experience is you, you get a bill and it's 28 percent. You say, oh, my God. Then you start working towards trying to get it down to 18. You cut some benefits. You have the employees pay a portion of it. So again, um, I don't see, and I think the ranking member mentioned, yeah, our expenses are going to go up there. I don't see the offsets anywhere. I think this is a trillion dollar uh, large entitlement going forward, and it does little or nothing for small businesses uh, in the country. And I think it is, uh, however you want to look at it, personnel expense used to be 20 percent of the payroll or whatever, tw benefits 20 percent of what you paid someone. Today there's a general feeling out there, do you want the salary or do you want the benefits, but you can't have both. And that's what's driving I think a lot of things up here. Uh, let me mention, you had mentioned about being in the printing business, and I was in the printing business for a lot of years. Uh, <clears throat> how much has your cost uh, gone up, say, in the last five years, and then in the last year, this year, and then next year? Do you see uh, a general trend or a percentage increase over, let's say, six, ten years? Pick a number. I would say the last ten years, my, the renewal for our existing policy has never been less than 12 percent and has been high as 49 percent. So every year we're faced with, as you described, the task of reevaluating what type of a new policy are we going to have to implement in order to provide coverage to the point that we're still able to provide a, a plan that we pay 100 percent of the premium costs for our employees. 
And then let me, Mr. Eaton, one other thing I touched on earlier today, I had to step out, but we have uh, people that have talked to us about this medical tax, and I think one of our surgeons mentioned something about that. Many of them are telling me that they're going to pay more in tax than they'll even make in profit, this 2%, 2.3% tax. Um, the fact of the matter is there's, uh, the medical device industry has about 400,000 employees in the country and another indirectly about two and a half, two million people, two million jobs that's being created. And they said if this tax goes into effect, it's going to really impede their ability to grow their companies. Uh, do you have a, a thought on that? Well, I, as I laid out in the testimony, that there's only a couple possible outcomes. Number one, uh, they eat the tax, but they don't have the financial resources to do it, so they'll probably go out of business. Number two, they take it out of employee costs. That means lower wages, fewer jobs, bad for uh, a struggling labor market. And number three, you pass it on to consumers in the form of higher prices. If medical devices are more expensive, insurance is going to be more expensive, and the problems on employers everywhere get multiplied. And as, as I mentioned, there's a perverse aspect of these taxes in the bill, which is that they're not deductible. So to just break even, if you have a dollar tax, you have to have a dollar fifty-four in additional revenue. So you have to raise prices a lot, and that's a big pressure upward on premiums in this law. Thank you. The gentleman's time has <coughs> expired. Mr. Pasquale is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to just respond first to Mr. Buchanan's remarks. Uh, what you've described is unsustainable. The exact situations which you described. Between 2007 and the passage of health reform, I had many small businesses. I have a small business advisory committee. And the increase in their health costs was between, on average, 28 to 40 percent a year. Health care reform, or as some on the other side would like to refer to it, Obamacare, and they say it with such love and charity. You can't sustain those numbers. I don't mean you personally. We can't. And those businesses, 60 percent of them are no longer doing any business. They're done. The primary cause of those businesses closing their doors, the primary cause, there are other causes, is what they have paid in their premiums. And I want to talk to you, Mr. Olivo, fellow Jersey guy. Uh, what's interesting, I read a little bit about what you said because I came in a few minutes late. But I want you to think about this. 95% of businesses are exempt from employer responsibility requirements. I just wanted to start with that. Now, I think there's a possibility, I'm not saying this is guaranteed or for sure, that it sounds like your carrier might have pulled a fast one on you, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when, you're, when they raised your rates and lowered your benefits last year, by the way, that's not unfamiliar to any of us. And we were a good scapegoat. Obamacare was the perfect scapegoat before it even went into effect. We'll blame this bill, which will become an act, on whatever we do this year. You saw what happened in California. It's a scapegoat. And we expect that. We're all big people. We, we understand what happens in political debate. You stated that your insurance carrier informed you that they would be uh, not be renewing your high deductible coverage due to the preventive health benefits in the new law. Are you aware of the fact that the new preventive benefits don't apply to plans such as yours that are grandfathered? I'd ask you. I ask that rhetorically. I just want you to think about that. And are you aware that the new uh, the IRS rules, not the new IRS rules, permitted high deductible plans to waive the deductible for preventive services even before reform was enacted? You know, I get a charge, I get a big charge out of listening to folks tear this thing apart. Someone on the panel uh, made the statement in a magazine that the elimination of denial of coverage for pre-existing conditions and the elimination of the lifetime limit 
those things drive up costs. Premiums are going to go up in the short run if we don't take into consideration preconditions. This is a battle. There is no question about it. We battle civilly here between what the insurance companies want out of this and what the patient really needs that we can, so we can really drive down the cost. We agree over the last 10 years. Premiums have skyrocketed. You and I both agree with that. Two Jersey guys here. <laughs> Families face bankruptcy due to medical bills. We agree. Certainly. Okay. And competition decreased, I go through each state, in the insurance industry. In fact, you know, the average state, there's two or three people, companies writing insurance. That's a good situation. Not for us, but for somebody else. I haven't heard any response about those kinds of things. And why should you? You got a script. Let's follow the script. The number of uninsured individuals grew that now one in five young Americans under the age of 65 are uninsured. Those are the numbers from the Kaiser Foundation. These conditions are not ideal. Nine months after health care reform, I'm proud to say that change is already underway. And I would conclude my remarks that if health care reform is bad for business, why have over 100 20 businesses in my state, New Jersey, received grants to support groundbreaking biomedical research on pancreatic cancer, brain injury, Alzheimer's, and more. This money supports jobs. Why have 150 employers in my state enrolled in the early retiree reinsurance program, cities like Newark, Patterson with one T, Clifton, all enrolled, and even big businesses such as Johnson & Johnson, uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, are enrolled in the, the program. The gentleman's they, time has they expired. They see the benefits. Thank you for concluding. And I thank you, the panel, for telling us. Mr. Smith is recognized for five minutes. What you did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> and thank you to the panel for uh, your sharing your expertise and insight. Uh, Mr. Holtz Eakin, if you could reflect a little bit on uncompensated care. Is it conceivable that even Medicaid would fall into a category that a hospital would would perceive to be uncompensated care? Yeah, there, there are two large forms of cost shifting uh, in the insurance industry. One is from uh, uncompensated care, the traditional someone walks into an emergency room uninsured, gets care, and has to be covered somewhere. And the second is the shifting from government programs where Medicare pays about 70 cents on the dollar relative to uh, private insurers, and Medicaid pays even less, roughly 50 to 55 cents on the dollar, depending on where you are. And those gaps have to made up, be made up elsewhere as well. So those are shifted onto private health care costs. And I mean, is it your assertion as well that the uh, health care bill does immensely grow the Medicaid rolls? Half of the uh, coverage expansions come through Medicaid expansions. 16 million Americans we put into a system that involves considerable cost shifting onto private insurance and which in, at present uh, they're twice as likely to go to, to ERs uh, instead of having uh, that care in a regular setting and where they can't find um, a, uh, in particular, a primary care provider uh, at anywhere near the rates other people can. Would it be conceivable that any federally initiated medical liability reforms uh, that they might preempt some state medical liability laws? Uh, th there is the option always for federal preemption, and so it, it would depend on how the law was written. Uh, but we do know that state-level experience has shown that a variety of different malpractice forms have been effective at controlling uh, some of the costs, and that if you had a strong federal preemption that applied universally, you'd have a much bigger impact. Well, I, I say that because I'm, I'm a little bit uh, nervous that Nebraska might lose its uh, rather optimal uh, scenario, uh, given it, its... Uh, <laughs> Medical liability. Draft carefully, sir. <laughs> uh, duly noted. And I, I appreciate uh, the business perspective shared here uh, this morning as well, certainly reflective of many of my constituents, uh, some of whom have said they've uh, held off hiring uh, new employees uh, simply because of the unknowns contained in the health care bill. So uh, with that, in the interest of time, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schock is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, will be brief. I have questions for the business owners. Uh, you know, uh, last year the President said his major focus uh, in 2010 would be jobs. Uh, in 2011, uh, last night in the State of the Union, he said his major focus will be jobs. So as two employers, I'm kind of curious specifically uh, with regards to how the health care bill is going to uh, affect jobs, and particularly those opportunities for young people in America uh, who rely on part-time employment through their high school and college years uh, to supplement their income, to pay for uh, education, which the President talked about last night being so important to America's competitiveness uh, and getting uh, long-term gainful employment uh, for their futures. Uh, Scott Womack, you mentioned that you, uh, you have 800 employees. Uh, and I'm wondering if you've uh, studied this bill, uh, which it sounds like you have, the effect on um, uh, what this will mean for your ability to hire part-time employees, considering the bill uh, really, uh, from what I'm hearing from my employers in my district, uh, almost incentivizes doing away with uh, part-time employment and really consolidation of the number of employees you have. Is that what you found, or how do you see if this bill is implemented as it stands now will affect the employment opportunities you can provide? Well, <clears throat> thanks for the question. Actually, it incentivizes moving people from full-time status to part-time status. Um, that part-time and hourly uh, job market right now is absolutely saturated with people, um, people you know, who, are, who are not working. So. Um, you know, the, the reality is we'll be looking to get people under that 30-hour that threshold wherever we can. So I don't, I don't see it helping at all. And of the 45 employees who are full-time that you offer health insurance to, how many of those 45 take your health insurance? That would be my company. Uh, oh. Currently, out of those 45, uh, I believe it's approximately 30 take the coverage. And do you know the other 15, do they not take it because their spouse or someone else offers? That is correct. Okay. No one at my company is uninsured. So it's not too bad that 30 out of your 45 seem to think your health care is a preference uh, and, and using the term in the, in, in the bill is adequate coverage? Yes. Their biggest complaint would be and I, is the cost of the premiums on the family side. But, yes, they, the, the coverage is great. They, they feel it's very fair. Do you know if your health care coverage that you offer now is going to meet the minimum standard in the new law for adequate health care coverage? The coverage that we offered in 2010 will not. We've already been notified of that because of how preventative care is treated. And how much do your uh, agents or your uh, third-party administrators suggest how much will your insurance premiums increase to meet the new standard? Uh, we just got our premium increases in the other day. Uh, it's a 12 percent increase in premium, but also a significant increase in how emergency room visits are treated. It's much more costly to go to the emergency room, significantly more. And so what will the cost per premium on the average be for you? Uh, for a individual, the cost per premium in the coming year will be approximately $280 per month per individual. Mm -hmm. Have they looked at what the, when the bill is fully implemented in four years, what, the, uh, what it will cost for you to be able to provide that minimum adequate health care coverage as specified by the law? Uh, I have no way of uh, computing that at this point. No. I'd ask your third party administrator to do that, because <laughs> I'm sure they're doing that. So thank you very much for your, for your uh, comments here today. Thank you. Mr. Kind is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our panelists for, uh, for their testimony here today. Mr. Chairman, from my perspective, uh, I think today's discussion is very healthy, and I would encourage you to hold more hearings in regards to the Affordable Care Act, because uh, there's some belief out there that with the passage of the Accountable Care Act, the Affordable Care Act, that somehow the discussion ends, and it doesn't, that somehow the work ends, and it shouldn't. I think we'll be judged ultimately in this Congress and future Congresses by working hard to find out what's working in the health care system and what isn't and making adjustments along the way. So getting testimony like this and feedback in regards to the shortfalls in which all of us are trying to accomplish, I think it's going to be helpful. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion in regards to job creation and what the Affordable Care Act means in that regard. Now let's just recall, we've had 11 consecutive months of private sector job growth in this economy since the passage of the Accountable Care Act. We've had 1.1 million new private sector jobs that have been created. 
Over 207,000 of that is in the healthcare industry alone. And I don't know how many of you saw a recent Forbes article that was uh, printed in the Forbes magazine, but a recent article in Forbes highlights how small business tax credits in the reform law are already helping small uh, employers deliver health care coverage to their employees. According to Forbes, we'll just look at the facts here, insurance companies are reporting a significant increase in small businesses offering health care benefits to their employees. For example, United Health Group, the nation's largest health insurer, added 75,000 new customers working in businesses with fewer than 50 employees within the last year. Coventry Healthcare, a large, a large provider of health insurance to small businesses, added 115,000 new workers in 2010, representing an 8% increase. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City, the largest health insurer in Kansas City area, reports an astounding 58% increase in the number of small businesses purchasing coverage in their area since April of 2010. Repeal of the Affordable Care Act, as my colleagues last week voted for, would entail the largest tax increase on small businesses in our nation's history. 16,000 small businesses in western Wisconsin alone would see their taxes go up, who are today benefiting from these tax credits under the Affordable Care Act. Over 4 million small businesses nationwide are taking advantage of the tax credits so they can better afford health care coverage for their employees. And what's ironic, and Mr. Levi, I appreciate your testimony here today, but the, the health insurance exchange that we're setting up for small businesses and for family farmers and individuals was based on the SHOP Act that I, in a bipartisan fashion, had introduced in previous years that NFI be endorsed. Ex the creation of an exchange so small businesses finally have a chance to go and shop with complete transparency so you know what the costs are and what the benefits will be, coupled with tax credits, which we did in the Affordable Care Act, is something that small businesses have been calling for for years. And it's part of this bill right now. But I think ultimately we're going to be judged on whether this works or not, depending on whether we have the ability to bring costs down. And here's another bipartisan idea that's in the bill. We have to change the way we pay for health care in this country. It's as simple as that. The current fee-for-service for system under Medicare is all based on volume payments regardless of results. This is crazy. And right now we have an Institute of Medicine study, two-year study, as part of the reform bill that calls on them to change the fee-for-service system to a fee-for-value reimbursement system. They will present an actionable plan to the administration, the IPAB Commission, to implement. And this is something that Newt Gingrich has been talking about for years, that Dr. Frist is still talking about today. Tommy Thompson, when he was at HHS, was told me that if we do one thing with health care reform, change the way we pay for it, starting with Medicare. Because whatever we do in Medicare is going to drive the private health insurance market. But it goes even beyond that. Health insurance companies from the East Coast to the West Coast have been calling for payment reform for years. Large providers, which are models of health care uh, delivery systems, highly integrated, coordinated, patient focused, from Intermountain to Mayo to Geisinger to Cleveland Clinic to Gunderson to Marshfield, have been calling for this very thing that we finally have the tools in health care reform to accomplish. We start with the accountable care organizations and medical homes and the innovation center telling providers, we want you to be creative. We want you to innovate. We want you to deliver high quality care at a better cost. This is where we need to drive the health care system. But ultimately, if we stick with the fee-for-service system under Medicare, we will bankrupt our nation because we will never be able to keep up with the cost, all based on volume payments, regardless of quality, regardless of outcome. And this is crazy. We finally have the ability now to do something about it if we play it through. You don't change the way you pay for one-fifth of the U.S. economy overnight. It's not going to happen. It's going to have to be transitioned. And we, we, we instituted that in the reform bill as well. So I would hope that we'll have a chance to come together in a bipartisan fashion again, talk about the payment reform, which can really lead to cost reduction for everyone, so that health care is something that will be affordable to businesses large and small and to individuals throughout this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Mr. Lee is recognized. We have to vote. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we're rolling votes. So I'm always going to be. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our panelists for, for being here. Uh, I can't help but be a little skeptical after hearing the President's State of the Union address, as well as the first panelist, Mr. Goolsby's testimony, uh, when it comes to reality of this health care bill that we're dealing with. If you remember last night, the President talked about in his speech with the dysfunctionality of our government when he used the example of the Interior Department is in charge of salmon when it's in fresh water. 
but when it's uh, in salt water, it's the Commerce Department, and if it's smoke, God knows where. Ironically, and I would ask this to Mr. Holtz-Eakin, isn't it true that this new health care bill will, in fact, create upwards of 160 new agencies, bureaus, and commissions? So in act, he's actually adding to the problem rather than fixing it. Uh, it, it the exact number has always been hard to figure out, but that's a safe <laughs> guess. I agree completely. The, the, uh, the other point, too, uh, is he brought up now the issue of the 1099. Uh, it is very apparent in my eyes that this was more or less a cash grab. This, this was put into the bill. If you're a small business owner and you do not have an accurate tax ID number, you are on the hook and have to withhold 28 percent as the small business owner. Again, these are huge costs on someone who is trying to get by in day in and day out. And I'm, I'm sure from uh, both Mr. Womack and Olivo that uh, in your mind, this health care bill, is it more likely or less likely for you to go out and hire people at this point? Anybody want well, to without a doubt, it, it's created a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's frozen credit markets uh, as far as restaurants go. Uh, those are just now starting to loosen up. But uh, as, as we get closer to this and the implications become more clear, credit markets are going to freeze up. Um, it's going to be harder to borrow money to, to build new restaurants. The other thing is, is that, as I stated earlier, the only way to, to pay for this in our business is to cut costs. And, and, and we are a lean, mean industry now. We don't have a lot of fat. And, you know, the, the things that we can control um, are our payroll and, uh, and to minimize the impact of, of these penalties. So that means cutting jobs. It doesn't mean adding jobs. We're getting to the tipping point where risk reward no longer makes sense for someone to go out as a small business owner and take his dream and go out and start a business. Uh, the, the other part, maybe I can uh, bring this back to Mr. Holtzikin with regards to, to Medicaid. I, I have the, uh, the luxury of living in New York State, which has far and away the highest Medicaid expenses. I think if you compare it next to equivalent states like Florida and Texas, where their economies are doing relatively better, uh, same number of citizens living in that state, but literally twice the Medicaid expenses. Uh, with the passage of this bill, ultimately, is it going to increase or de decrease the Medicaid costs that we're seeing in New York State? I think the states are at great risk. Um, they are obligated to honor the expansions under the Affordable Care Act. Um, they may get additional payments from the, from the federal government for that, but they have to pay full freight on any current eligibles who now show up and take up benefits. And I think a real risk is that in advertising the Affordable Care Act, we're going to put, draw out of the woodwork a lot of existing eligibles, and New York State will have to pick up their full share of their cost. At a time where it, to uh, start a small business in New York State, it is a, it is a huge obstacle. And uh, again, I, I'm someone who's run a small business. I just see this as a, a further death knell for the, the creative side of what made this country great. And I, I would say the same thing deals with the medical device tax. When we are trying to, I come from manufacturing, when we're, we're we, the President spoke again, a contradiction of talking about and helping uh, businesses thrive, we're going to go now and add a tax onto a business. Again, uh, Mr. Holtzik, in your, your view that is this going to uh, help our manufacturers in the health-related health device industry compete? Is it going to help or hurt them? Uh, th this is an additional cost for our device manufacturers on the international market. It's going to hurt their competitiveness. It's also one of many taxes that if you just look at pure macroeconomics, the evidence is that discretionary tax increases of exactly this type, things that have nothing to do with the business cycle, you just do it for other purposes, the evidence of Christy Romer, the former chairman of the Council, chairwoman of the Council of Economic Advisors, is that they're three times more detrimental to the economy than equivalent spending changes. So if you look at this act as a whole from that perspective, the tax increases, negative impacts, far outweigh any possible benefits of the spending. Thank you. Thank you. The, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Black, will inquire for five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you again, panel, for being here. I uh, look like I'm the last one here, but the audience will still hear this question. And all of you can answer this question, but I think, Mr. Womack, you particularly talked about health care savings accounts. and. Um, Continually, the administration has claimed that the health care law is giving Americans more freedom in their health care choices. And uh, 
In reality, this law is really going to force many Americans to buy a product, which is a government-defined health care product. Um, in addition to that, um, he, President Obama also promised that the American people, if they liked their current health care insurance, they would be able to keep it. Uh, but as we see in the law, it will limit the um, use of health care savings accounts. And um, being in the medical field uh, for a number of years, 40 years now, I think that one of the things that we've seen that has driven the cost of health care up is that we've taken the consumer out of the driver's seat. And they're not making choices. And I was very excited about maybe expanding this product because it would give an opportunity to put somebody back in the seat that wants to be in the seat and would also give more um, opportunities for different vehicles rather than a set uh, type of insurance that most employers uh, do have and offer to their employees. Um, Mr. Womack, I think you're the one that mentioned about health care savings accounts, and all of you certainly can respond uh, about where you feel that this might help companies if they were given that choice to use those as, a pay as compared to being forced into a certain product or a certain um, type of care. Thank you. And I, I'm a Knoxvillian, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, nice great. Nice to see you. Um, we were faced with a, a huge premium increase this last year, and I can't remember the number because uh, we were bidding and, and we saw so many different numbers, but it was in the neighborhood of 30 percent. And so we decided to go ahead and look at an HSA, and we did uh, begin to offer an HSA as an, as an option to our, to our managers. And uh, I have my own HSA story. We, my wife had an, an MRI ordered recently and, uh, by the hospital at a cost of $1,100. And uh, someone said, you need to shop that around. And so we went out and, into a, a diagnostic facility, uh, literally just down, down the road, uh, and got the same procedure for $350. Uh, you know, and that, I, truthfully, I don't know that we would have even thought about that had we not been using an HSA where we were, where we're spending the money out of our account ourselves. So it's those, and that, that type of story gets told over and over and over uh, in, in HSAs. They're just a huge benefit. When you put the, when you put the individual more in touch with, with their own spending, they will find ways to control it. And, uh, and they get to keep that money in the account uh, and roll it forward. And it's just, it's a beautiful plan. It should not be impeded. We shouldn't do anything uh, to, to hamper HSAs. Thanks for the question. I, I would say very quickly, I have a similar story. We put the health savings accounts in six years ago. And at the first year, the employees resisted it, did not like it. But over time, they have grown to appreciate those that take care of themselves, have seen their savings accounts grow. And I, too, have seen instances where employees had exams or uh, scanning type of tests to be done and were able to go online and literally save a couple thousands of dollars because they were able to research it themselves and there was an incentive there to do so. Yes, Mr. Holtz again. Yeah. But do you have a comment? Oh, well, I. I don't have the business experience of these gentlemen. Certainly in the, the alternative reforms that were envisioned in the debate leading up to the Affordable Care Act, uh, one version is to put consumers at the centerpiece of this one-fifth of the economy in the same way that they have driven the other four-fifths to be the largest, strongest economy on the planet, and, and then, you know, require insurers and providers to compete in price and quality, and uh, that's a very different vision than what we see in this law. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Rangels, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me uh, thank uh, this uh, panel uh, for sharing with us the problems that you're having uh, with this legislation, especially those of you who work every day in uh, dealing with employees. Uh, tell me, both of you and certainly the, the chamber, uh, advocating repeal of the law that the president signed. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And you don't have a plan that you're recommending. Uh, do you strike that? You think that we're better off without any changes in the law than to enforce or to amend the existing law? I could say from my vantage point as a, a small business owner that for, I look at it as action-reaction. 
for Cong what Congress has passed, I'm seeing far more significant negative reactions to any positive that this will bring to my employer. I can understand that, but my question, and I don't have any experience at all in hiring employees, is that as a businessman, and I know you can't speak really on this issue, Mr. Womack, for the chamber, but for yourself with your businesses, you'd rather see the government just stay out of it rather than to amend or try to correct uh, the existing law, is that your position? Oh, I, I guess I've gotten used to the government being in, in the middle of things, and I, I don't say that sarcastically. We, we anticipate some sort of, some sort of change. Do, do, you, do you have, I, I'm concerned what happens if we just stop this, and uh, all of your employees, one way or the other, covered by uh, some type of health insurance? Uh, I don't believe so. And so you do have employees that are uninsured that you would want to see insured as anybody would, just right? Absolutely. But the, the problem is... Do you have any idea there. as to how you would want to insure these people uh, that are uninsured other than what has been recommended and passed by the Congress? No. And the reason is, is very simple. The, you know, we're talking about more money than is available. We don't, we don't have the money. I, I, and so, listen, they, the problem we're facing, there's a sharp differences of, a, of opinion here. Uh, the uh, National Business Group on Health <coughs> indicates that, uh, that they don't think they can get a better solution to the problem I'll mention during their lifetime, during our lifetime. If they get repeal or gut it, we'll have to start all over again and we'll be worse off. And so I think, generally speaking, every nation truly believes that access to health care is important for the strength and security of the country and that our workforces should be better educated and, and, and be exposed to preventive care and, and health care. You want that. You're just saying that you can't afford it. Absolutely. Well, our job is to say that one way or the other, the government is going to make certain that it is affordable. Uh, we consider that as a national obligation and goal. Uh, all industrialized countries do it, not because of compassion, but even in the question of competition, we do believe that an educated workforce and a healthy workforce is more productive. I can understand how you cannot afford to do what basically you would like to do, but you just can't leave those people out there hanging that have no insurance at all when we find out that personal lives and families are shattered, uh, bankruptcies, uh, not because of you and not because of the employee that faces serious illness. So if you wanted to help them, and I truly believe you do, uh, it doesn't help the family to say, hey, my boss is great, he just can't afford to help me out this crisis. No, I believe, and a lot of people disagree, but I truly believe we have an obligation to at least give access to health care, one way or the other. And if you don't like this way, I, I, I really believe you have some type of an obligation as business people that have the experience that we don't have, generally speaking, not just to live the, leave these people out there hanging. And to say that no insurance is better than, than what we have, I, I don't really think that's a legitimate, I don't think it's fair to us to say all the things we've done wrong and not have any positive suggestions how we can take care of those employees that you want to take care of. Well, Mr. Engel, and, and this is a dilemma that's been discussed for years, and so, you know, I don't take any offense to your comments. The problem The, the gentleman's is, time has expired, if we could sum up very quickly. Okay. The, the problem is that, in a nutshell, uh, the only solution, if, we, if you ask employers in our industry, and I'll just speak for my industry, if you ask for employers for my industry to pick up that burden now, it's a crushing, complete disruption of our, of our industry, and we can't turn on a dime. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you.
Uh, I want to thank Mr. Holseekin for testifying. I understand you have a previous engagement you need to go to, uh, leave for. And, That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And uh, if any of our members have any further questions for him, they could submit that in writing. And I would be delighted and apologize for having to excuse so, myself. So, Mr. Chairman? Yes. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, before you go, Dr. Holseekin, I'm going to send to you some inquiries about uh, the forum. Um, and I'd like very much if you could respond. I'd be happy. Um, you're a sister organization, as I understand it, of the American yes. Action Network. That is correct. And <laughs> Well, let me just finish. I want to tell him what I'm sending him. I was told he was going to be here until noon. Um, and so, as I said, I think your website and that of the network says your sister organizations. Uh, uh, yes. Um, and we know the action of the network and if, so if the I, gentleman could conclude I uh, will conclude very quickly Dr. Holtzikens has indicated that he will respond by I, letters I want uh, to let him know in advance the gentleman from Michigan will have his his inquiry okay. answered so okay I, so I just want you to know so it doesn't take you by surprise I'm going to ask you if you will reveal the sources of the income of the forum will you do that uh, I will uh, comply with the the bylaws of the forum and with the, the U.S. tax laws. And I'm, well, I'm not an attorney, and I will get your questions, look at them, and do what my The gentleman will, will, will you, respond. Will you disclose the uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, well, the why gentleman don't you let from him Georgia, finish? Mr. Price, will inquire for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I apologize for not, not being here earlier, and I'm, I'm sorry that, that, uh, that Mr. Holtzikin has to leave, but I wanted to uh, uh, just make a comment about some of the, the uh, taxes in the provision that are uh, stifling the innovation. The medical device tax, as we all know, when, when, when you tax something, you get less of it. Um, and, and the medical device tax, uh, I believe, and many believe, that, uh, that, that, that that increase in taxation there will significantly decrease innovation uh, and, and affect uh, um, uh, remarkably uh, uh, high-paying jobs that have wonderful benefits to our society. And I think that that's uh, a direction that we ought to look at. Uh, there are, uh, the estimates are that 2.3 percent increase will be passed on the consumers uh, either directly or indirectly also. So, but I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Oliva, Mr. Womack being here, and I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the consequences. Uh, maybe Mr. Oliva, if you want to just talk about your business itself. Um, the, the, this bill has all sorts of requirements and, and stipulations and, and, and mandates that, that every single business in this country, employer in this country, has to look at. What, what have you, what, how much time have you spent in, in trying to make certain that you're going to be able to comply? What kind of costs have you expended to try to make certain that you uh, will be able to comply? And what, what, what incentives are, is the bill providing you that, that might not be necessarily beneficial to your business itself? I have personally spent hours of time that I could better spend managing my business reading the health care bill. I haven't read it in its entirety, but interpreting it and using the resources I have with the business organizations like NFIB and trying to interpret how it's going to affect me. Um, I, your question was as far as exactly what the extent what, and, and what, what have you determined? How, how is it going to affect you? Is it, it, Just at every level. It's, it, when I, just my concern about hiring a new employee, the cost that goes into hiring an employee is not just his wage. The health care costs are such an integral component of, of what it costs me. And when that's unknown and when there's all this legislation hanging out there, it really makes me more conservative and say maybe I don't need that employee at this point in time. So the continued uncertainty and, and the, the potential rules and regulations that will be passed on um, leave you less able to, to expand your business or to hire new employees. Is that an accurate statement? Without a doubt. Great. Mr. Womack, um, I know that, that, that 
my sense has always been that, the, that there are some perverse incentives within the bill itself that, that, that make it so that employers look at the situation and they say, it's going to cost me more to provide health coverage for my employees. Why should I do that? Shouldn't I just let them fall into the exchange? Are, are you hearing that from your members? And I wonder if you might expand on whether or not that's an accurate assessment. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, of course, again, we, we can't afford the coverage, so we're, you know, we're absolutely going to have to look at the penalties. We, we have a real concern that our insurance companies uh, th that we've talked to are not going to allow us to continue to offer the coverage to, to our salaried staff based on uh, rules very similar to um, 401k rules regarding highly compensated employees. So that means that uh, really through a, a whole other avenue, uh, it, it, we either offer insurance to everyone or drop it for every, you know, or drop it. And uh, we have you know, 50 families uh, on health insurance now in our company. Uh, and it's an important part of what we offer as a benefit package. So the, the, the statement that we heard throughout this whole discussion, if you like what you have, you can keep it, may not necessarily be true in your, in your business. Is sure, that accurate? Sure, absolutely. Um, that, would, would you expand, uh, or would, do you have any thoughts on, on the incentives for other businesses, uh, uh, small businesses, to, uh, uh, to move individuals, their employees, from the, the coverage that they currently have to the exchange? Well. At, at, you know, I, I measure that penalty really at twenty eight hundred dollars because mm -hmm. two thousand dollars is not tax deductible. You have to account for the taxes you pay on the income to pay the penalty. So it's really more like twenty eight hundred dollars. Uh, I, I cannot imagine that in the boardrooms across the U.S. that people are looking at you know fifteen thousand dollar premium for an employee or twenty eight hundred dollars. You know, very quickly you do the math and and you're going to opt to drop that coverage. And it may not be just that simple math. It may be some sort of event uh, where you know you have an issue with an insurance company, or you have a you know a forty percent rate increase, and that's finally yeah. enough's enough. In fact, aren't you almost in in in, in the uh, in the the real world obliged to drop that coverage because your competitors will do so, and then you are at a competitive disadvantage? Is that is that an accurate statement? I would say that offering insurance is a, is a significant. A benefit that that helps make us more competitive. So we always want to offer the insurance, and we just can't afford it. Thank the you. The gentleman's time has expired. The general lady from Kansas, Ms. Jenkins, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, on a panel before you, uh, we had the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Dr. Goolsby, testify. And uh, during his testimony, I noted that he said this, the Affordable Care Act has already begun to help small business become more competitive by making health insurance more accessible and more affordable. Uh, Mr. Lebo, you're a small businessman. Uh, could you give me an example of how uh, the act has helped you, has already begun to help you uh, become more competitive? Uh, unfortunately, I could not give you an example. I, all I can tell you is that our existing insurance, uh, which the employees like the coverage, is no longer available, and our insurance premiums have continued to rise in a double-digit percentage for the coming year. Okay. If, it, if they haven't, in fact, already begun to, uh, can you give me an example of how you will see them, uh, how you expect them uh, in the future? Uh, to cause you to have a more competitive uh, health insurance and accessible and affordable plan? I, I don't see how it, it's going to be help us uh, offer a plan that's more competitive. Uh, my concern with the exchanges is that um, they're not true exchanges in the form of competition. They're still heavily mandated types of policies, so there's not real true competition. Living and residing, working in New Jersey, we have the, I believe it's the third highest insurance rates in the nation. Uh, we've had guaranteed access uh, community rated plans since 1993, and I can tell you from that point when that law was instituted, and I've been running the company since 1988, I have seen a direct correlation with our health call, care costs beginning to rise from when that uh, guaranteed access was put into place. So I just don't see anything that's going to make the premiums less expensive. Hmm. Okay. Also in Dr. Goolsby's, Goolsby's testimony, uh, he said this, the Affordable Care Act can be a significant benefit to the job market 
by easing the burden of health care costs on small businesses. So once again, as a small businessman, I was hoping you could tell us approximately how many jobs that you will be able to create thanks to the savings uh, that you will incur. And, and I could say for my company specifically at 45 employees, we are not eligible for any, ta any sort of tax credit, which he, I believe, was referring to. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Womack, uh, I was home in my district last week and visited several uh, major employers who have over 50 employees. And uh, there was a consistent message I was receiving this day that they were frustrated uh, with the regulations coming about due to this bill. And one in particular that they mentioned uh, was that uh, they were being required to provide lactation rooms uh, if they employed more than 50 employees. And uh, several of them were concerned. They had multiple locations. One location only had three men working at it uh, if they were required to uh, provide a lactation room uh, for those three men because overall their employees uh, totaled more than 50. I just wondered if you had any concerns about this particular uh, regulation or others within this bill. Well, I, I do now. <laughs> Thank you for informing me of that regulation. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that, and of course, uh, uh, no surprise. There, there are so many things buried in the law that uh, you know, we don't seem to be aware of. Uh, I don't, I don't know how to react to that one in particular, but. You know, this you know, layering on of all these little things, I mean, they just go on and on, um, creates a tremendous amount of, of uncertainty and, and, you know, quite frankly, uh, depression <laughs> amongst the business community, just wondering how we're going <coughs> to keep up with it all. Is there any estimated cost for your business uh, to meet all of these? I guess that you probably can't if you didn't even know about this one. Uh, you probably don't know about others to really adequately estimate. You know, we're looking at that big bill, and uh, and we're we're not counting the small ones right now. And the big the big bill is is frightening enough. Okay, um, if uh, the Affordable Act isn't getting it done for you, the Republicans had an alternative bill, and we had tort reform, expanded FSAs, HSAs, uh, purchasing across state lines, access pools. What other ideas do you have for us? The general lady's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I recognize the ranking member, Mr. Levin, for five minutes. Thank you very much. And we really appreciate your coming. I, I regret that Dr. Holtz Eakin had to leave. And uh, I'm sending him a letter today. Um, and since this was a public hearing. I'll make that letter public. And I expect uh, him to give us an expeditious response. But again, I very much uh, respect uh, your different uh, views. Everybody brings different experiences, and we need to tap into them. So let me ask you, Mr. Womack, how many employees do you have? Uh, approximately 900. And how many of them have insurance? About 50. And all of the 50, are they in a certain category or two of work? Uh, they are either salaried uh, management people or office staff. So none of your employees who aren't in management or on office staff have health insurance through their work? That's correct. Um, you would be required to provide health insurance under this new law? Correct. Or pay the penalty. Or pay the penalty. Um, so your 800 or so are part of the 50 million who have no health insurance in this country? That's correct. Uh, have you inquired into what the cost would be to insure them? Yes, I've run those numbers many times. And you find it too expensive? It's, it's much more than we earn. And so therefore, trying to get control of health care costs would be 
potentially helpful to you in terms of having your uh, employees covered? Absolutely. The problem is the number has grown to a size where even if you cut it in half, which is not going to happen, but even if you cut that number in half, it's, it's beyond our ability to pay. How, how many of them um, do you know are covered by some kind of a public program? I have no idea. Uh, you know what percentage are women? Uh, not off the top of my head now, sir. Just roughly? I'm going to guess um, roughly half. Do you know what happens when they get ill? Uh, they, they go seek treatment and, and uh, you know, at the local provider and, and they, they get treatment. Um, how do you know they get treatment? Well, we hear the stories. You don't have any systematic way of knowing? No. They go to emergency rooms? Probably, or their local doctor. And they go to a local doctor who doesn't charge them anything? No, they go to a local doctor that does charge them something. What's the average wage of your non-salary, non-office uh, employees? It's approximately $9 an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. Libel, um, you have a high deductible plan? That is correct. Uh, what's the deductible? Well, it, it varies. I mean, uh, well, I, I roughly within $100, I would say the current deductible for an individual is $1,500, and for a family, it's $3,000. So they pay the first $1,500 the or that the first uh, $3,000? Correct. I have no further questions. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, let me just thank both of you for taking the time to come in here and share your small business background and experiences and uh, go through a pretty lengthy hearing. I, I just want to touch on something because I know Mr. Holtz, he's going to have to leave. But, you know, last night the president said that we do need to be a nation of innovators and a nation of leaders. And during this speech, he reminded us of what it takes to compete for jobs and for industries. And as entrepreneurs, I'm sure you can appreciate us, that especially. But he did say, and I agree, we need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. We have to make America the best place on earth to do business. And there is one American industry I have to mention because it's a Minnesota success story as well, and that's the engine of innovation and growth in the healthcare field. It's medical devices, and we heard from some other members earlier about that in the medical technology industry. And that's an industry that employs about half a million individuals and routinely revolutionizes patient care. And unfortunately, the health care law does include a new $20 billion tax on this innovative industry. I'm going to call out one company in particular because it's a larger company, uh, Boston Scientific, which employs more than 5,000 individuals in my home state of Minnesota, has estimated that that tax is going to cost the company an additional $100 million a year and up to 2,000 jobs. It's also going to cause a substantial cutback in Boston Scientific's research and development budget, which is the origin of where all this innovation comes from that the President talked about in his speech last night. And, you know, knowing that 62 percent of the medical technology industry is small businesses, small businesses like yourselves, for instance, you took an idea, you took the risk, you started it out, I'm just really worried that we're, we're, we're killing an industry that is going to be very difficult to jumpstart and bring back here, and we can't afford to lose it. And so just knowing we have to keep that innovation here, I, I had to make the comment because Mr. Goolsby had, had mentioned earlier that one of the benefits of that tax uh, as a part of the legislation was going to basically allow about millions of patients now to access uh, these device procedures that would not normally have had that market before. And I think the reality is, is that we look at it now in Massachusetts, which was the model option. Uh, or the model upon which the, the legislation was built, there was no increase in device utilization at all, as was, I think, suggested. But I want to follow up just real quick with both of you, since you're small business people, and the health care savings account and the flexible savings account portion. And that's because, you know, we know the health care law instituted new caps on popular flexible spending accounts, FSAs, that individuals use for their health care expenses. And the law also prohibited the use of F FSAs in health care savings accounts for purchases of over-the-counter medications without a doctor's prescription. And you mentioned a little earlier about 
as an employer what some of those uh, results would be or some of the detriments of the changes in the law would mean and knowing that there are 10 million Americans that use FSAs and 35 million Americans uh, using uh, FSAs, uh, uh, HSAs and FSAs. Would you explain just, I mean, give the patient perspective. I mean, you, for your employees, as a small business that wants to have an additional option, I mean, from a patient perspective, what does that offer your, uh, offer some ideas for your, for your employees rather than just the employer? Well, as, as I had said before, we, we have uh, had the health savings account, the high deductible plan for six years. And I have witnessed how it has improved my employees' incentive to better manage not only their health, but how they cho choose to go about uh, get, attaining health care. And it, as I said before also, the first year was, was very rough in the sense that it was an HMO. These people were raised on HMOs, and they did not like having to pay $150 initially to go to a doctor when before it was $15 at the time. But over time, as they see their health savings accounts start to build up, and they see if, if I take better care of myself, I could get off this medication, and now I save money, it has certainly improved how, how they go about purchasing the health care. Mr. Womack, you want to comment as well? I think that any time that you, you allow people to accumulate money in an account like an HSA for the purpose of spending on their, on their uh, expenses, uh, it becomes a huge incentive for them to really manage all those little costs. And sometimes those little hidden costs, uh, you know, can be significant. Um, and it just, you know that when you have the money in your account and you get to keep it, uh, you have a very big incentive to, to manage your costs. Well, and Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the testimony. I just want to comment. I, I've talked to numerous small businesses and their employees that feel like they've had the rug pulled out from under them now as they've gone through this adjustment uh, to take care of their health, uh, their own health care. And they're going to have to make a huge adjustment now as the law has been changed. And I would rather see us move in the expansion of FSAs and HSAs to allow more flexibility and control costs. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, at this point, everyone uh, has at least in the committee has gone through inquiring once. As long as we have other members who would like to inquire who haven't inquired to this panel, uh, we'll we'll leave that open. Uh, Mr. I've not uh, I'm aware, and uh, gentleman from California will be recognized uh, after I inquire. Uh, Mr. Olivo. Uh, you currently indicated you had 45 employees, and prior to the recession, you had 54 employees. And, and I assume, like most businesses, that you would like to uh, grow your business. But under the Democrats' health care law, if you have less than 50 employees, you are not subject to the employer mandate tax. Will that have an impact on your decision to hire more workers? Without a doubt, it will. And it, it'll put me in the position that not only questioning whether I should expand or which rate, slow down the rate at which I expand and make me seriously consider, but it also puts me in the position that once I reach that 50 employee mark and I either need to provide health care or pay a penalty, as I had mentioned previously, the penalty currently is less than my premiums. And unfortunately, that is a scenario that I will have to look at. And I might mention, I was talking to an employer in, in, in my own district in Redding, California, was in the same situation, that he had about 45 employees, and just knowing that made a difference of whether he was going to grow or not. But you also mentioned in your testimony that you currently provide health benefits to your employees and that you pay 100 percent of the premium for employees who choose high deductible plans. You also contribute to these employees' health savings accounts. Could you elaborate further on the benefits of pairing a high deductible plan with a health savings account, and what would be the impact on you and your employees if this kind of coverage is no longer available under Obamacare? Well, yes, that is something with the savings that we've been able to gain with the reduced premiums from the health savings account we have been able to contribute in certain years to our employees' accounts. 
which uh, really helps them pick going towards paying that deductible. So there are some years in effect that not only are we picking up the cost of the premium, but we are picking up approximately two thirds of the cost towards their deductible. So for all intents and purposes, uh, their first thousand dollars is covered under the plan. Um, I would just say the health savings account have just been a huge benefit to us towards managing the escalating premium cost. I wouldn't sit here and say that it's the sole answer, but it, it, without a doubt, if we did not have the ability to offer health savings account for the past six years, I would not be able to wear, pay anywhere close to 100% of my employees' premiums. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Thompson, for five minutes to inquire. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just want to point out um, a $9 employee uh, under best case uh, scenario is making around $15,000 uh, a year. And I don't care where you go for your health care on $15,000 a year, uh, chances are you fall into that category of uh, uncompensated care. So it's not being done, it's not being paid for out of pocket, it's not being provided for free, it's factored into what's driving up the costs for your salaried employees, for everyone else who buys a policy, or everyone else uh, who pays uh, out of pocket. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record uh, a letter that I have uh, that's, uh, I, I just got a copy of it, it's from uh, 275 economists from all over the country, including three Nobel laureates, four Council of Economic Advisors, a former CBO chief, and two John Bates Clark Prize winners. And the letter states that... Uh, without quote, objection, the letter will be... Thank you. The letter states, I just want for the, for the uh, folks to know, uh, it says that we write to convey our strong conclusion that leaving in place the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010 will significantly strengthen our nation's economy over the long haul and promote more rapid economic recovery in the immediate years ahead. Also, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to point out uh, a letter that uh, the Secretary of Health received from a uh, an, an entity that you're very familiar with, and I'm, I, I believe actually get some benefits uh, from this, the, uh, the uh, CalPERS uh, organization in our home state of California, which is the nation's largest non-federal government uh, purchaser of health care. And in the letter they say that, uh, and I quote, they believe that key elements of the national health care reform represent a fundamental and positive shift in the way health care will be purchased and delivered in the United States. Together they will dramatically shape the future of health care in our country and ultimately benefit everyone, close quote. Um, they say that uh, more specifically that uh, the provisions uh, regarding uh, uh, retired folks in 2011 uh, that they will save approximately $200 million based on the reimbursement rate uh, to more than 115,000 early retirees, their spouses, and their surviving spouses, uh, and their uh, dependents. Uh, they've also submitted written testimony uh, as uh, well in which they discuss that this year they will spend $6.7 billion on health care benefits for 1.3 million active and retired state and local government employees and their families. Further testify that the overall structure of the law, which focuses on constraining the skyrocketing cost of uh, health care in, in our country uh, while providing quality and ensuring health coverage for tens of millions of uninsured, some of those, those $9 an hour employees who can't buy health uh, care, who fall into the uncompensated health care costs that the rest of us all pay for, is the right policy prescriptions for this group, the largest uh, non-federal government purchaser of health care uh, in the country, its members, and our country at large. Uh, I would also ask unanimous consent to submit a copy of this letter for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, Without objection. Uh, thank you. And uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. T. Berry, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you both for taking time away from your families and your businesses to come here and, and provide us with 
perspective from where you sit. And uh, your testimony, your verbal testimony earlier reminded me of some discussions I had with local constituents, both small businesses and restaurant owners and retailers. In fact, uh, a restaurant owner uh, operator said to me, perplexed, where did 30 hours come from? In federal law, uh, full time is always 40 hours, and suddenly it's 30 hours. Mr. Womack, uh, you have 900 employees. I hope that you'll reconsider and come to Ohio if we can change this piece of legislation. Uh, I'm from central Ohio. My first job was at McDonald's, so I understand a, a perspective of the restaurant business. When I was working at McDonald's, a number of the people that I worked with were under the age of 21, were on their parents' policy. I was as, as a 16-year-old. And a number of the adults were, were uh, women who had coverage through, their, through their, uh, their spouse. So my question to you is, and I have two, is how many employees now do you have that will be impacted by this new regulatory framework of 30 hours as, as full time? Uh, if you could answer that, and how many, and I'm sure it's a guess at this point since you don't have the figures in front of you, employees do you have are teenagers at your restaurant or college age students who have coverage through their parents or maybe a spouse who has a coverage through a, another, another spouse? I think my best guess, and this is purely a guess because we've not run the numbers, but my best guess is about 20 to 25 percent of our, our staff are under the age of 20. Uh, or 21, and um, a substantial number of our employees are people who are second earners, uh, bringing in a second income into the family. And, and we know just anecdotally, uh, especially our, a lot of our service staff, they're, they're the second earner and, and they have, you know, their spouse has uh, coverage elsewhere. So, so uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, so if you have a number of people who are already covered, whether they be uh, teenagers working their first job or a, a spouse with, a, uh, with insurance and, and there is a second earner, Th these costs, additional cost onto your business will create a, a situation where at some point in time you're going to have to choose whether or not that person gets a raise, whether or not they get other benefits, or whether or not you hire somebody? Sure, absolutely. How many people could you hire in Ohio if this law hadn't been passed? What was the projection that you had uh, before this law became this, this bill became a law? Well, our plan from here is, is to open 12, 13 more restaurants in, in Ohio, in, uh, in central Ohio. In central and, Ohio. Uh, Thanks for the good news. Yeah. And uh, our, we think that, um, you know, if we have to cease development, um, if, you know, if there are no changes and we have to stop development, you're looking at 260 to 300 full-time jobs and, and hundreds of, of part-time jobs. And then there's also, you know, construction and, and um, all the other things outside of our company. Mr. Levo, uh, your testimony brought home a call I got right after the election from a constituent who was on his cell phone screaming at me regarding a meeting that he just came out of with his, with his tax lawyer and his tax accountant. He had 51 employees, and they were giving him a briefing on the new health care law and some other regulations. And the gist of the meeting was, if you can figure out over the next year how to get under 50 to, to not have to comply with this new regulation, or our, our, our recommendation is to put all your employees, if you are still over 50, into the government exchange, uh, rather than continue to provide the health care you provide today, which obviously goes against the, the premise of the debate, which if you like what you have, you can keep it, or that this isn't a, a bill that disincentivizes entrepreneurs from creating more jobs. And why he was yelling at me was, with Ohio's unemployment above 10 percent, he's getting advice from his legal professional that he should not hire more people, but figure out how to hire less people, or the alternative is put people into the, to the government exchange, which he didn't want to do, but from a competitiveness perspective and cost of doing business and trying to survive as his business. I know you've talked about it already, but can you share with us as an entrepreneur how frustrating it is for you, whether it's a state regulation or a federal regulation, inhibits your ability to project long-term growth and how to grow your business rather than figuring out how to abide by all these new rules, what that does to your spirit as an entrepreneur? 
Well, not just Spirit. I mean, just to give you an idea, we purchase a, a new piece of equipment. They are fixed payments. I don't have the luxury of going back to my bank and saying, well, geez, my expenses are a little more. My health care costs were more than expected. I have to make those payments. So I have to leave myself a margin in which that my calculations may not be exact. When there's this much unknown regarding the health care law, it, it really causes me to be much more conservative. And it's, it's affecting how much I'm willing to invest into the company and grow it until right. I get a better understanding of what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chair, you. Mr. Chair, Chair I'd like to submit for the record, if I may. Yes. Uh, a letter dated January 18th, 2011 from 239 economists, and they write uh, just one sentence, we believe the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is a threat to U.S. businesses and will place a crushing debt burden on future generations of Americans. All right. Without objection. Um, I uh, just want to ask a simple question of both of you. Um, we've heard a lot of testimony today. There's been some of it very technical. Just on balance, does this health care legislation help you create jobs and help you grow your businesses, or does it make it harder for you to grow jobs and, uh, and expand your businesses? From my point of view, uh, what my concern is is that I know many on this committee want to provide health care coverage for everybody and would say, well, how, how would I explain to somebody that I would not provide health care coverage for them? My fear as an employer is going to an employee saying, I have to eliminate your position because not only can I afford your health care, I can't afford your position anymore. And that, that's what my concern is. All right. Mr. Womack? Well, the, the reality is that this just scares business people to death. And any time you have this level of fear and uncertainty, we quit, we quit growing, uh, we tighten up. Um, you know, I, I like to, I mean, we have to have a reserve. Uh, we can't go out to the edge financially and, and, and then suddenly have $5 gasoline or, or uh, commodity prices go through the roof and have no margin, no cushion uh, to survive. So uh, it just makes us more and more conservative and that means trimming, pure and simple. All right, thank you. Thank you both. I think at this time all members President have had a chance to inquire of this panel, and I want to thank you both very much for your thoughtful testimony and for um, the efforts you put into providing uh, livelihoods and prosperity to the employees that you have, and I know the difficult responsibility that is uh, that you carry around every day. So I want to thank you for taking the time away from those endeavors to be here and help enlighten this committee. And uh, uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned.